Hello, 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 hello. How you guys doing? And gals. So uh, give me a shout out if you can hear me and see my screen. You should see the trial stuff going on right here. Hope you guys and gals are doing well and staying safe. Um, doing that ZBrush from home. Excellent, excellent. Thank you for verifying the sound there. All right, so welcome to another Z Classroom Live session here. Um, so I've been doing these little developer streams and we've been focusing on kind of the basics of uh, ZBrush. So if you download the trial, you can just pop into one of these streams and hopefully learn something. Um, so that was the whole process for the streams I've been doing. Uh, the trial is out, so if you know anyone that wants to try ZBrush, or has had an interest in ZBrush and just maybe hasn't had time to learn it, if you're at home now and you're looking for something to do, definitely you can download the trial. It'll give you 30 days of ZBrush. Uh, you'll have all full featured uh, ZBrush there and you can try out different things and see if you like the software. Um, one caveat with the trial here is that it will work for Mac and Windows. It will not work on iOS. So if you have an iPad, um, you will not be able to use the trial. So we've had a few uh, people that have tried to download the trial for iOS and it will not work on iOS, but it will work on a Windows machine and also a Macintosh machine. In addition to the trial, we have multiple ways you can get into ZBrush. So we have a monthly subscriptions and also perpetual licenses. So multiple avenues to get into ZBrush if you know someone that's looking to get into it. Um, the subscriptions plans feature monthly and also six month. And then our perpetual licenses, we've never charged for an upgrade. And so these are the prices here listed for the full version of ZBrush. We also have ZBrush Core. And ZBrush Core will come in even at a lower price rate. It's the light version of uh, ZBrush. So basically the full version is the professional version. And then we have ZBrush Core, which is kind of our intro uh, version for ZBrush. So you can do a lot of stuff with Core, but it doesn't contain all the bells and whistles that the professional version has. Uh, some of our other developers, Daisuke and um, Salman, will be doing ZBrush Core developer streams too. So if you have ZBrush Core, you can jump into one of those streams and see this stuff happen live, ask some questions, and kind of get some information on ZBrush Core. Once again, Core has monthly subscriptions and perpetual license versions of each of those. So for today, we are going to be focusing on doing some live Boolean stuff. So I'm going to go through the live building process and basically talk to you guys like if you've just downloaded the trial and you're just using ZBrush for the first time, kind of the steps you need to go into it. Um, some of the other streams I've done have gone even more basic. So if you need to, you know, just figure out how to do sculpting, I say uh, go back and watch the replay for the first uh, Z Classroom live stream I did where I just model a bust. And that one's going to bring you down to like the basics of just getting a piece of digital clay into the application and then sculpting on it. Um, so you can get really simple and get great results out of ZBrush, or you can get really complex. So ZBrush has a lot of stuff that's in it, but you often don't need to use all that stuff to produce great artwork. So with the live building stuff, there's also some videos here on Z Classroom you can follow after this. If you watch the live stream and you still have questions or you want to follow along with another uh, tutorial, there's an intro video that will go in some of the basics. Uh, I'll cover a lot of these in the stream today. Um, the Live Boolean Computer Case Fan is a whole project series you can kind of go through and use the Live Boolean system to kind of create a case fan. And there's a project that ships with the trial of ZBrush, so you can just open up and follow along with that. And then finally, there is a uh, video set here on fixing Live Boolean errors. So the Live Boolean system is fairly robust, um, but every once in a while, if you have some weird shapes or geometry in your mesh, you could end up getting some uh, topology errors. And so there's a whole video on how to find those issues on your mesh and also fix them. So I'm going to hop over to ZBrush here. Uh, this is live as well. So if you guys have questions during the stream, definitely uh, shoot them out. Um, I'll see if I can get to them. Once again, I'm trying to keep this at more of a basic level. So if there's any like high advanced uh, techniques or questions on that kind of stuff, I may be able to answer them quickly, um, but I probably won't be able to demo them just depending on uh, what time I have to get through uh, this stuff. Uh, Paul also, his streams are going to be more of the high concept type stuff. So if you have any of those really like high related questions, uh, pop in his streams when he's doing them and he'll uh, be able to help you out. 
All right, so to start, let's say I just launch ZBrush here, and at the top, you'll see we have Lightbox. So Lightbox is ZBrush's browser inside the application, and this allows you to see the contents of your files that ZBrush saves and loads. So think of it as kind of like a bridge for Photoshop. Now, one thing nice about this is if you're using Lightbox, you're gonna get a preview of what models you have. Um, and so one folder that you're probably gonna use a lot when you're in here is gonna be this quick save folder. So we're gonna use a lot of uh, quick saves during here to save our files and they will end up being in this folder. And when they're in there, you'll be able to see little previews and then to load anything in here, you can just click on it and then double click and I'll load that file in and you'll be able to get in and start using the application. So for today's thing for the live Boolean, um, I'm just gonna grab this C sphere or the uh, Dynamesh Sphere here, the 128 version, and I'm just going to double click that to load it in. If Lightbox is not open when you launch ZBrush, you can come up here and click this Lightbox button that will show and hide Lightbox. There's also a hotkey of comma, so if you press comma on your keyboard, that will also open and close Lightbox. Another thing, uh, any interface items that you hover over inside of ZBrush, you'll see if they have a hotkey assigned to them, it will display that hotkey. So you can see if I hover over Edit Mode, it says Edit Mode and it has T next to it. While you're over these options, if you hold down the control key on your keyboard, you'll also get a little pop-up with some auto notes that will display some more information on the process. So if you ever find yourself wondering, well, what does this button do? Um, hover over it and then press control and there may be some information on there that will give you a little more clarification of what that button does inside the application. So another little way there to get some kind of help if you're using ZBrush for the first time. Uh, another thing for my voice is echoing. Uh-oh. Is it still echoing? I don't know if I can resolve that. We'll have to see. <laughs> Let me know if it, if it gets better. Uh, another thing with the application, there is a help menu at the top here. And in here, you have an online docs you can search. So you can just click that. It'll open a browser window, and you can go in there and search different keywords that are inside ZBrush. So if you want to know about Dynamesh, you can click that, go open a browser, type in Dynamesh, and then you can find out stuff on that. Here we have a link to Z Classroom, which was that page that had the options and the videos covering the live Boolean. Uh, we also have our support site here. So if you come across anything that's like, hey, this might be a bug, um, you can send us a ticket at support. All right, so I'm gonna select that Dynamesh Sphere 128, and I'm gonna double click that to load this in. And after it loads in, you should get something like this. Now we'll talk briefly on the uh, interface stuff here, just for navigation purposes. And I have a little floating, little floating uh, keyboard here, just so you guys can kind of see this. So after I loaded this file in, it's basically ready to go. So you could grab a sculpting brush and start sculpting on it. Uh, for navigation stuff inside of ZBrush, there is a few hotkeys I'm gonna cover quick. Um, but if you're brand new, you may want to use these buttons right here. So we have a move, we have a zoom, and then we also have a rotate. Um, and these are going to be your kind of go-tos for using the navigation inside of ZBrush. So to move an object around, zoom in and out on it, and then also rotate it. So if you're brand new, um, definitely use these buttons here. They'll help you out. And then correspondingly, you can also use some hotkeys inside uh, the application as well. So the main one is if you're hovering out in the blank spot of your model. So my model's here, and this is called the canvas. If you click and drag here, this is gonna allow you to perform a rotate. And I'm just gonna make a mark here so you guys can see this quick. And as you click this, you'll be able to rotate around your model. So just clicking and dragging will rotate. And then if you hold down Alt and click, this will pan. And then to zoom in, which is really kind of hard, um, is basically the first thing that I was doing inside ZBrush for navigation that was the most tricky was the zooming in and out. So if you're brand new, use this. Um, if you want to know the hotkeys for the alt-click navigation zoom, it's hold down alt, click in the canvas, which will give you that pan. And then as you can see here, I'm pressing down with the mouse. And then if I release alt and drag with the mouse, this will perform that zoom. So you have click off, rotate, alt, click, pan, alt, click, release alt, zoom. So those are your hotkeys for moving around the model inside of ZBrush. And as you're rotating, if you hold down shift, this will lock that model into a front back side axis there. So you can snap into different things. Uh, so Brian's asking me, Chad, this is another beginner course. So yes, I'll be covering the basic stuff uh, if you've just downloaded the trial. And today we're focusing on the live Boolean. So inside ZBrush, this is just your kind of normal way um, to do this. And we have uh, 
our subtool list over here. So we're going to hit this quite a bit. If you've just installed ZBrush, you're going to have this visible count set to four. If you want to expand or show more subtools while you're working on your meshes, because when we start using live building, we're going to start taking a bunch of different shapes and we're going to start modeling in a negative fashion. So you think, you know, you can add positively, but you can also model negatively. So if you cut one shape out of another, you get a different result. And so to do this, it's going to use a lot of subtools. So we're going to come over here and I'm just going to adjust this visible count some. So you can change the slider here and this will allow you to see more subtools in your scene. So by default, it's going to be at four. I usually like to leave it at eight. Uh, some people who have, you know, massive amounts of subtools, they'll crank it all the way up and it will go all the way to 24 there. And so you can then end up having all your kind of subtools visible at the same time because this list will grow uh, quite large if you start adding stuff to it. So for the live Boolean system, it's basically a preview. And so what this allows you to do is allows you to preview Boolean actions and you can then manipulate these, change these on the fly, modify these. And then after you're happy with them, you can then convert them to true geometry. So here I have just a sphere of uh, topology here. And to use the live Boolean system, we have to first activate it. And that can be done by coming up here and clicking this live Boolean button. Now, when you click this, this is going to tell ZBrush, hey, we're in live Boolean mode. And you're gonna see pretty much nothing happen on the screen, right? I've gone through and there is you know, no change. I've just activated a button. And this is okay, this is what you're gonna get. Now, the next thing we wanna do, I want to come through and I wanna append another subtool in my scene. So in order for the live Boolean system to work, you need to have more than one subtool. So right now I just have this sphere, I have live Boolean tooled on, turned on, but there is no result. So I'm gonna come over here and click append. And when this opens up, I'm just gonna select this sphere 3D object here. So just selecting another sphere object. And now this is gonna to append to my scene. Now these two spheres right now are stacked on top of each other. So if I come over here and click on this second sphere, I can switch to it. And then right now you'll see that this sphere got dim. So if it's selected and I have no color on it, you're gonna be able to get this highlight of basically the subtool you currently have active. So I've selected the second sphere and the first sphere went dim, but I still can't see this one. So we can also change the visibility of our tools and this can be done by in our subtool palette over here, there's an eyeball icon. So if you think about layers inside of Photoshop, you can come over here and toggle this on and off and this will allow you to see or show which subtools are visible. And if you have eyeballs icons off on everything, you're only gonna see the selected subtool. So here's my first sphere and here's my second sphere. Now, with my second sphere here, what I want to do is I'm just going to move it out in space. And to do this, I'm going to use the Gizmo 3D. So I have that second sphere selected. I'm going to come over here and I'm going to switch from draw to move, scale, or rotate. Now, draw mode is going to allow you to sculpt. So if I'm in draw mode and I sculpt or touch my model, you're seeing I'm going to be able to sculpt on it. However, if I switch to move, scale, or rotate, this is going to give me this Gizmo 3D. And the Gizmo 3D is a universal manipulator. So with this selected, if I perform a gizmo action by coming over and hitting move, using a scale, maybe a rotate, I'm gonna be able to manipulate that subtool in my scene. And this is just only manipulating this subtool I'm currently on. So if I come back over here and activate that first sphere, so I have my sphere that I have selected, which is giving me this uh, coloring on it. And then the first sphere is being dimmed. And now if I use the gizmo 3D, you can see it's only gonna affect that secondary sphere. So I can move this out in space, you know, position it somewhere else on the model. The Gizmo 3D also has these move screen options and it also has a rotate screen option. And these are handy too for just moving objects really quick and it's gonna be based off your camera angle. So if I rotate my model to the side here, I can then move it like this. And if I rotate back to the front, I can move it like this. So that's what these little kind of border move screen options are gonna allow you to do. So now that I've positioned this model off to the side here, what I want to do next is I want to tell the Boolean system, hey, take this second sphere I've added and set it to subtractive. So right now they're set to both additive, so I'm seeing both these spheres at the same time. However, if I go to the subtool palette over here and I locate that second subtool, there's these little icons that live on the subtool. Now these icons, if you switch them normally, they're not really gonna do anything. But once you have the live Boolean system active, that is when they're gonna kick in and start to become active. So if I come over here, we have a union, and then next to it, we have a subtraction. Now you'll see as soon as I click this icon here and switch to subtraction, that sphere has now vanished. So if I go back here and click the first one, you can see that it's still there. If I click the second one, it has vanished. 
Now this is vanishing because the live boolean system is now seeing this as a negative shape or a subtractive element. So it's removing it from the scene. It's saying, hey, you've got live boolean on, let's remove that shape. Now if I come up here and turn off live boolean, you're saying I'm gonna get it back. So live boolean has to be on and you have to have a subtool that's set to something other than the union option here to see that result of that live boolean subtraction process happening. Now, once you have the subtractive option set, if I rotate the model here, you can see I'm not getting a change on this. So you want to make sure, too, that you may have the eyeball icon turned on, and then you want to make sure that your model is penetrating your mesh. So as you can see, as soon as I turn that eyeball icon on, ZBrush recognizes that the, that subtool is also visible, and you'll see now it's cutting the second sphere into the first one. Now this is a non-destructive workflow too. So what this means is that anytime now I can now manipulate this sphere that's set as subtractive and I'll be able to see the change happen in real time. So if I use that move screen space and move it, I'm gonna be able to manipulate how this is cutting into that sphere. So just moving around the object, you can see it's cutting right into that mesh. Now if I turn on my polyframes, this will allow me to see the mesh I'm editing to, so this helps sometimes if you're definitely you know, using a lot of subtractive forms, you're not going to be able to see them in your viewport. So you could come up here and turn this off and see them, or you could change it to union and see it, um, but basically it's easier to just come down here and click this polyframes button, and this will now display the mesh in its subtractive view with kind of these hatched lines. So now I'm getting it as still that subtractive element, but I'm kind of seeing it or seeing through it. And so I can apply any normal actions with this. I can move, I can scale, I can rotate. And you'll see as I'm doing this, it's doing this live Boolean process in real time. So I turn my polyframes and start manipulating this. I can start tailoring the shape. Now that's the basics for the live Boolean. So adding two elements here that I have. So a subtool one, a second subtool, the second subtool is set to subtractive and both eyeball icons are turned on. And then in addition, I have the live Boolean set. So now, with this, this is how I can start manipulating shapes. I'm gonna look at these questions here quick, and then I'm gonna jump to a different uh, project file in uh, Lightbox here and kind of talk about some other processes with the live Boolean. Let's see here. So the keyboard I'm using, uh, so I'm using NoBoard is the uh, keyboard program I'm using, and then I have another application that's called On Top Replica, and I'll double this uh, keyboard I have and place it over top of my screen there, so that way it's always going to be on the screen. So I have two of these uh, keyboards on screen. I got one right here, and then I have another full-size one on the secondary monitor I got here. Glad you guys are liking the streams. Yeah, so no board and on top replica. Those are the keyboard. I'll see, I'll type it in here. No board and on top. Those are the two applications that I'm using for that. All right, so. Now that, uh, I'll, Nick, I see your image here. I'm gonna look at it quick, but I don't think I'm gonna be able to go into it as well. It better be a good image here. So for this one here, I'd say pop into any of Paul's streams. So he's been doing a lot of this stuff with his hard surface type elements. Uh, we'll be covering some of the detail things here, like these options through here. And, um, you can definitely use the live booleans for a lot of this to get these little designs. Paul's uh, last few streams been focusing on like a ship he's been doing, and they've been doing a lot of the processes that I see here that would be used to uh, make this mech. So I definitely check out his streams. All right, I do not use a voice mixer. This is it's just it's just what I sound like. <laughs> on this on this Apple headphone that I got in my ear. One day I'll bring my uh, recording set up here, but I'm on, this isn't my normal space. So this is uh, my internet at my uh, shop where I work from primarily and use ZBrush primarily and record all my uh, pre-recorded stuff. Has like, you know, microphone and sound clouds and all sorts of that stuff. But then this is a, um, a conference room I'm borrowing that has better internet. <laughs> and so I have a laptop here and another monitor that I bring in and set up uh, to do this so that you guys have, have enough bandwidth basically um, to show you guys stuff and not have it go like robotic chugging. 
All right, so now let's get into something that's a little more advanced with the Libolium. Well, not more advanced, just more practical. So I'm gonna open up Lightbox again, and in here I'm going to locate this uh, jewelry folder here. So I hit comma on my keyboard or click this Lightbox button here. In here I'm gonna locate the jewelry folder and then double click. And this is gonna open up and we have some different files you can use to kind of mess with to create jewelry designs. So I'm going to grab this uh, signet ring one right here and then load this guy in. So just double click. It's going to ask me if I want to save the project I was currently working on. At this stage, I was just messing with the sphere. So I'm going to say no. And then it's going to load in the ring here. And now I should have this loaded in. Now with this ring object, if I turn on my polyframes, you can see it's pretty dense and it's set up with Dynamesh. So Dynamesh is ZBrush's uh, kind of digital clay system, and it'll allow you to take a model and flood it with even topology. And what this means is that if you have a Dynamesh model and you go to sculpt, if you sculpt here all the way down, you should get a consistent stroke all the way through. So it kind of takes your model and does this reprojection of topology across the entire surface, trying to keep it even. So when you sculpt on say the ear or say the mouth of the character, you get that same consistency across your mesh. And so this model has Dynamesh active. So I've got the tool palettes and go down here to the geometry area and go to Dynamesh. You can see it has Dynamesh turned on and its resolution or what the amount of uh, density or topology that the mesh has is set to 128. So if I increase this resolution slider, it would allow me to get more details on the surface. So that's just there, just the terms of what type of mesh this is. Now, what I'm gonna do with this ring here is I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna add one of those uh, sphere primitives back in here and then show you guys some of the power of modeling with this subtractive form. So once again, I have live boolean active. I have this set to union here and you see nothing really happening. So this is just the same thing I had earlier. So in order for the live boolean to work, you have to have it turned on. You also have to have a secondary subtool. So I'm gonna come over to the tool palette again. I'm gonna click append and I'm gonna come over here and I'm going to grab this sphere 3D object. And so you can see now I have my ring base and I have that sphere 3D object. Now once again, I wanna make sure that I have both the eyeball icons turned on over here so that the live boolean sees them as being visible. And then I wanna come down here and I wanna select that sphere. And you'll notice when I selected it that it's gonna get toned in this kind of white color and then everything else that's unselected is gonna be a little dimmed. So now that I have the sphere here, I want to set it as subtractive, and this is going to allow me to see the uh, subtraction process, the live boolean process happening. So I'm coming over here, turn that on, and now I'm getting this result. So that ring is now getting that sphere subtracted from it. So if I turn on my polyframes, you can see it's still there, but it's just being previewed in this live boolean preview as subtractive. Now what I can do is I can now manipulate this sphere here. And to do this, I can use the gizmo as we did before with the sphere. So I'm gonna switch to the move gizmo here. And move, scale, and rotate will give you the same gizmo, so it doesn't really matter which one you're in if you're using the gizmo 3D. So just one little thing there. And now with this loaded, I'm just gonna start messing with the sliders here. So I can start or messing with the gizmo 3D here. So if I start scaling it, I'm basically taking that sphere object and I'm compressing it. So I'm doing this to it and wherever it's intersecting, it's performing that subtraction process. So as I squeeze it in like that, you can see now I have this, I can now move it up and I can start tapering the shape design. So maybe I want something like that. Maybe I can taper it more like this, pull it back down. And so you can see just by manipulating that secondary subtool, I've now created or modified my shape. So now instead of having that simple flat ring or that simple signet there, I've gone through and now added this kind of dimension to it. So it's really fun to play with the live boolean system because you can see how much difference you can get. And all I'm doing is I have the gizmo 3D active and I'm just scaling the model. So if I turn on my polyframes here, this is that subtool that I took. So I took the sphere and compressed it on or off. And now if I grow this out, this is all I'm doing. I'm just doing this manipulation. So it's simple scale, simple move, simple rotate. And you see it's changing that shape dynamically. And this is all non-destructive through here. Now, this is just the subtractive part. So in addition to subtractive, you also have a third option over here. And this is going to give you an intersection. 
And so what this is going to do, it's going to look at this shape. So the Boolean works in a hierarchy system. So it'll go from the top to the bottom. So it's going to look at the volume of the first shape, look at the volume of the second shape. And then if I have this active, it's going to give me the contents of those two volumes where they intersect. So if I activate this one now, this is the result I'm going to get. So it's taking the space where the secondary sphere here is intersecting the ring and it's giving me the result of that. So now I can come through and say taper my ring like this and all I'm doing is finding out where that intersection is and now changing it. And now we end up getting that shape. So just a simple manipulation and I'm just moving one sphere, one subtle sphere over here across that ring and now I've changed the result on this. So, so far we've been doing all this with just two primitives as well. And you're not limited to only using two options with the live Boolean. As we talked about when we got in here, there can be a lot of subtools that can come into play and you can keep adding to your shapes and keep growing how these Booleans are going to be generated. So let's say I want to go through and I want to add another shape now. So I'm going to come over here and click append. And now I'm going to say grab this uh, ring 3D primitive here. And this is now going to come in. And with this, let's say I want to subtract this from the shape as well. So I can roughly position it where I think I kind of want it. And then I come over here, make sure I still have that live Boolean on. I'm going to select the second option here with subtractive and boom, that is now subtracting out of that shape. Now you'll notice as I do this, I can rotate this around. I can play with the designs again, and this is just manipulating the second shape. Now we talked about how this is all hierarchy based, right? So we're taking the first ring. ZBrush is then going to process the second part as an intersection. Then it's going to look at this one and process as a subtractive. And it's always going to do it top to bottom. So if I change the order here and say move one of these up or down, it's going to change the look I may get. So if I move this ring up, now ZBrush is looking at this one, subtracting this one, and then doing an intersection again. If I change this to say a union now, you can see now I'm going to get this kind of effect happen. So I have positive ring, subtracting out the cylinder, and this one is now positive as well. And if I come through and say duplicate this ring again, get second one, and then I'm gonna move that below it, and just click and drag to move subtools as well, and set that to subtractive, you'll see now I have positive ring, subtracting that ring, then this is gonna get added, that initial uh, kind of egg shape I have there, and then I'm subtracting this out again. Now you'll notice that the subtraction is going all the way through, but as this ring right here, if I move this up, you can see it's only gonna cut into the ring because it's directly below it. It's not gonna cut into this next one because it's after it, right? So this one's cutting to that, but it's not gonna cut into this because it's a positive shape after the, that cut. Now if I move this one down, below that one, now it's gonna cut into both. So now it's gonna cut all the way through and it's going through both this one and that one. So you gotta think of the hierarchy as you're using the live Boolean because it's gonna go from that top to bottom and then as it does this, it's gonna figure out, hey, okay, I'm subtracting from here, I'm subtracting from here. Oh, you've added one. Well, these two that you just said is subtractive are no longer gonna subtract from this new one because it's below the stack. Does that make sense? <laughs> so as you play with it, you'll kind of figure it out. And it's all non-destructive. So if you mess anything up, you can just simply, you know, redo it, bring it back, and you know, say, I want that the way it is, like that. Maybe I don't want this subtractive anymore. So you're at this stage, you're not doing anything crazy that's destroying anything. You're just playing, and it's really free-flowing. Free uh, you don't have to worry about, you know, making a huge kind of error or anything like that, because if you don't like what happened, you can just move things around and undo it. So you've not committed anything at this point. Now with this, we talked about that mesh being DynaMesh too. So if I go back to this ring here, um, and we showed that this was a DynaMesh model, then this one here was just a primitive model. So this is just a 3D primitive that's been turned into a shape. So this has no DynaMesh active. I could say come through and Z remesh this. Uh, Z remesher is a process that's going to give you new topology across the surface. And then let's say for this shape here, we can do another mesh process, which is uh, division. So like if I want a um, subdivided model, I can divide this up and I'll turn off my subdivisions here. So now I've just taken this and divided it normally. Now the live balloon system will work with any topology inside of ZBrush as long as it isn't a 3D primitive. So we have a DynaMesh model, 
We have just a normal polygon model. Then we have one with subdivisions. And then this one's just a, uh, we'll do this one as a decimated model. Now, if you're new to ZBrush, this is all gonna be very confusing. <laughs> but just know that it, you can have whatever geometry you have, as long as it's a surface you can sculpt on in ZBrush, you can use it with the live Boolean system. So here we have that, and we have this, we have this, and we have this, and they're all different mesh geometry types inside of ZBrush, and they're all working with the live Boolean. Now, another thing nice with the live Boolean is that you can also sculpt on your meshes as they are in this preview mode. So let's say with this ring here, I wanna to switch to the draw mode over here to get the standard brush, and I just wanna apply some sculptural marks. So if I come over here and sculpt, you're gonna see that I'm able to sculpt on that piece and still see it happening or applying that live Boolean. So you can also tailor your shapes while they're in this Boolean preview. So I can come through and say, pull this edge out and I'm raising this edge here. So if I just turn on solo, this is what I'm doing on the model. So I'm just sculpting like this. So I'm making a mess. But then if I turn the Boolean on, you can see this secondary shape right here is still doing that intersection. And so as I sculpt on the surface of this, that intersection is still happening and I'm getting that change. So you can do a lot of crazy things just going through and even just sculpting on a mesh, building up the surfaces, changing things, and the live Boolean is still gonna kick in and give you a result. So you can get all sorts of stuff like noises, Boolean noises, change the shapes of your meshes. You can use any of the brushes inside of ZBrush. So if I wanna say like take the move brush, I can go to the brush palette over here, and then isolate by the letter M by clicking on M and then locate move. I can now say hit control Z to get back to where I was. And I can move like this. And as I move the surface topology here, you can see I'm manipulating that ring and the Boolean's kicking in and now I'm changing the shape or the design of it. And this is all done in real time preview right here. So now I've added this kind of element to my shape there. So a lot of stuff you can do with the live booleans just by playing with the different shapes and forms. <clears throat> so let's see, we got any questions here. So Darkin is asking, do you have a workflow for switching between ZBrush and Fusion 360? So basically uh, anytime like uh, applications such as Fusion 360 are CAD based, so they usually add uh, allow for uh, n-gons and things like that. ZBrush is always triangle based, so it's going to be triangles and quads. And so the process, you can be able to go from Fusion 360 to ZBrush pretty easily, um, but going back, you're going to get a mesh. So ZBrush handles meshes, not n-gons. So one little thing there with, say, going to Fusion 360 or another CAD system like uh, SolidWorks. But basically, if you have a model that you've got in Fusion 360, if you can bring it into ZBrush as an OBJ, an STL, uh, PLY, FBX, like any of those kind of default file formats, you can get it into ZBrush. Then you can use, say, DynaMesh to give it even resolution. You can use Sculptress Pro with it. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways you can bring that model in, crease edges, and uh, start sculpting details on it. But usually it's from a CAD application to ZBrush. The going back part um, isn't really... Uh, that fluid, but going from an application like a CAD program into ZBrush is going to work fine. And that's a whole nother <laughs> thing in itself. I do have uh, some videos on Ask ZBrush on how to import CAD data. I think I have some uh, SketchUp ones where I've brought in a model from SketchUp and then process that inside of ZBrush. So you can watch those and kind of see the process for that. They'll go through in like setting up grouping and add increasing to keep those edges hard and then sculpting on the mesh. So HD is asking, I thought live meant that it's always procedural and can't be baked. It's just regular Booleans with a preview. So yes, the live option is that it's just a preview. It's a live preview of the Boolean operations. It's non-destructive at this stage. And then after you're happy with the result, you can then commit it to a uh, true geometry model and that's gonna give you a result. Uh, Bean is asking about uh, Dynamesh. Yes, so he's, he's commenting that using DynaMesh for blocking out the initial shape and then retopologing and adding details. So if you're going into DynaMesh, DynaMesh was created in order to generate base mesh topology. 
And so with that topology, basically you block out your shape, get your silhouette, and then after you have your model as a DynaMesh, the process would be that you'd subdivide it. So you had your initial shape, you then subdivide it to get those other details you want on your mesh. So DynaMesh was never really created to you know, max out and be used as a lot of people use it today. It was intended just for like a base mesh block out. So Cam is asking, is this all the Booleans do? So yes, in, in the basic aspect of it, that is it. You are able to add different parts to your mesh and you can subtract shapes from it. You can create intersections or you can create unions. And it gives you a way to build in the uh, negative forms. So oftentimes if you have a shape and you wanna say like, for me to model say a hole out of this, I can just come through and say append in another cylinder. I can take that cylinder, say rotate it 90 degrees maybe scale it down a little bit, and then say place it where I want it, scale it out like this. And now instead of me having to model that hole into that surface of the topology there, I can just take the cylinder and cut it out, and now I have the hole right there. If I want to add another one, I can duplicate this shape. So one option you have inside of ZBrush, if you have a subtool, anything that is unmasked, if you hold down the control key on your keyboard and you click and drag the Gizmo 3D, it will allow you to duplicate that part, so it's basically gonna take the subtool and take that uh, geometry island and duplicate it. And so now I have two of those, and then it's unmasked so I can reposition it. So now I've just cut holes into my shape. And since this is dynamic, I can now move these and change them. I can scale them up and down. You know, I can decide if I like it or don't like it. So there's a lot of just power in the preview application of this. So Bean's asking about the Gizmo 3D orientation. So you'll see as I move the Gizmo around, uh, you can unlock it by holding Alt, and this will allow you to change where the position it is. So if I want to take the Gizmo 3D and move it here to say perform a rotation from that point on the subtool I have, I can hold down Alt and then move it to a new position and then let it go. And that will move that Gizmo 3D. If you want to get it back to say world space, so if you hold Alt and click on a surface, it will end up uh, changing to that surface. So if I click here, it's gonna snap there, snap, snap, snap. And let's say your Gizmo 3D goes crazy and you end up with something like this. And you want it to go back to that world axis. All you need to do is unlock it and then click this little reset orientation button here and it'll reset it back to the world axis and then you can lock it again. And then that'll allow you to reset your Gizmo. So a little thing there with the Gizmo 3D. Uh, Webb is asking what is better to divide or DynaMesh. So there's really nothing better about either of them. Uh, DynaMesh isn't going to give you subdivisions. So if you need to repose something, uh, basically you'd want to probably use subdivisions because then you have a lower res version of your mesh that you can scale down to. And then you can make large scale changes at that low resolution. And then you can scale back up and get all your high details back. If you go with DynaMesh, the DynaMesh resolution is gonna be what the mesh has. So it's great for sculpting, but if you need to go and manipulate something, move something around, you're now gonna be trying to move a lot of topology, um, where if you had a mesh set up with a low res subdivision level, you'd be able to move it a lot easier, position it a lot easier, and then divide back up and have your details. So there's nothing really better about them, they're just different workflows. Uh, Darkens asking, does the CNC plugins still work? It should. <laughs> um, you can download the CNC plugin for ZBrush uh, from the uh, Pixelogic Resource Center. And on there, there's a bunch of different helpful plugins you can download that will kind of automate some stuff inside of ZBrush. Uh, Divying is asking, can you change the brush shape from round to square? So there is an option on any of the brushes inside of ZBrush, you can apply a alpha stroke to these, and these will allow you to change the alpha of the brush. So basically the tip. Um, so if you think about say like, you know, Photoshop, how you have different things you can apply to get that Photoshop brush effect, this is how you can do that. So if you have say a sculpting brush, you can change the stroke to say a rectangle, and then instead of getting that a spherical kind of fall off when you move the brush across the surface, you'll end up getting a uh, harder fall off. Fall off. If you watch the um, first uh, set of uh, uh, Z Classroom Live where I go into the sculpting stuff, I'll switch from say in that video or in that stream, I switch from the standard brush, which has a soft fall off. So if I come across my mesh here in sculpting, you see it's a soft fall off. You can see there it is. 
And then if I switch to say something like the clay buildup brush, which has this alpha attached to it, if you now sculpt across the surface there, you see I'm gonna get this. So using the brush without any alphas is gonna give you this kind of soft shape. And then if you have an alpha tag to it, like the clay buildup brush, you're now gonna end up getting that harsh form. So you can control the tip of the brush just by changing the alpha. Look at these questions here quick. Uh, Wieland is asking if I lost the center of sphere and I can't get back, is there a way to find the midpoint for it? So if you have a subtool selected, so say like this here, and I have the Gizmo 3D and it's off in space somewhere over here, and I wanna get back to the Gizmo 3D being in the center, what you can do is, all you have to do is click this little home icon right here. And this is gonna look at any unmasked parts and then move it back to the center. So if I click this here, it's gonna to go to the unmasked mesh center and that should now put that directly in the center of that egg shape there. Now that process also has a hotkey. So sometimes the Gizmo 3D may be off in space. So see it's over there. So I can't really see it unless I move my entire model. So there's a hotkey for that process too. So if I go to the tool palettes, and then scroll down to the, let me find it here, the masking area. There's a go to unmasked mess, eh, go to unmasked mesh center button here. And if you click this, that'll return it back. So you can bind this to a hotkey. And then if your gizmo goes crazy, you can just hold, uh, click that hotkey and run this, uh, link it to that button, and it'll go right to there. Now to create a hotkey, this is a tangent, um, but basically if you want to create a hotkey for anything inside of ZBrush, all you need to do is hover over the icon or the button, hold down Control and Alt, and then click. And this will now tell you at the top here, oops, let me do that again. It'll tell you at the very top of my screen, upper left there, press any key combination to assign a custom hotkey or escape or mouse button to cancel. So let's say I want to take this button here and I want to apply it to the letter J on my keyboard. So hitting, holding Control and Alt, clicking on the button, now pressing J will now assign that hotkey to J. And so you'll see if I hover over the button now, it's going to say J. And so now if I unlock my gizmo, move it over here and press J, it's going to go right back to the middle. So that is how you can hide or assign a hotkey inside of ZBrush. And then just pressing J now will center the gizmo 3D. Now, if you have uh, masking on your model, that will also be respected when you use this go to unmasked mesh center or click this button right here. So if I have this part masked off and now I press J or click this little icon, you see it's gonna move it to the unmasked mesh center. So if you wanna center back to the middle of your model, make sure you have no masking on it either because uh, it's looking at the volume of the entire shape and it's gonna go, try to go back to the center. And then it's also respecting masking. So if you have a part masked off, you're able to get that gizmo into that unmasked mesh part. So little thing there with the gizmo 3D and masking. All right. So now we talked about how the live boolean will work with sculpting. It'll work with any type of mesh geometry inside of ZBrush. So it'll work with dynamic geometry. It'll work with uh, zero mesh geometry. It'll work with decimated geometry. It'll work with dynamesh geometry. It'll work with subdivision geometry. The only thing it's not gonna work with is up here we have primitives that are labeled 3D. It will not work with 3D primitives. However, if you append any of the 3D primitives to your subtool list here, it's going to convert them from that 3D primitive to geometry, and then you'll be able to use it. So these little rings here were primitive 3D models, but then when I appended them, it converts them automatically, so then they can be used. But if you came up here and tried to use just the cylinder object here with the live boolean, it would not allow you because it is a primitive 3D shape and not a poly mesh. 3D shape. So a <laughs> little confusing thing there, but basically pretty much everything inside ZBrush will work with the live boolean system. Uh, all right, so now let's say I go back to this and let me just do that. I'm going to delete those little holes there. Now let's say I'm happy with this shape. So I went through, I made my Boolean stuff, and now I'm happy with this, and I wanna take this, and I wanna convert it to geometry. So I could go in and start sculpting all these elements, but this right now is still giving me a preview. So this part right through here, where it's creating this edge, it's creating it by two different shapes. So if I come through and say grab the ring here, and I start sculpting with uh, clay buildup, I have to do it on this one. You can see I'm affecting this, 
but I won't be able to sculpt directly on it because this is still in preview mode and I still have this Boolean coming in and creating a different element for me. So what I need to do is say if I want to 3D print this or maybe sculpt on it as its entire form. So use this as like a block out and now I want to add, you know, convert to one mesh so I can then sculpt on the entire thing, add some say noise to it, something like that. Um, I need to convert it from the live Boolean to traditional geometry. Now to do this, we just need to come over here and we need to select our top uh, tool here that we have. So I'm gonna select the very top, the signet ring part here. So the one that's the, probably the highest in the hierarchy. And now with this, if I come through and go to this Boolean area, so tool, G, tool, subtool, Boolean, open this up, there's this button called make Boolean mesh. Now when I click this button, ZBrush is gonna look at that Boolean process and it's gonna render how the preview is rendering it. So it's gonna look at the top tool, then it's gonna go to the next one. If it's subtractive, it's gonna cut it out. It's gonna go to the next one. If it's say an intersection, it's gonna do an intersection. It's gonna go to the next one. If it's add, it's gonna add. So it's gonna go through your tools like that. Uh, next to this button, there is this DSDIV option here. And if it's your first time in ZBrush uh, and you're just doing what I'm doing here, you're not really gonna have to worry about this. Um, but as a general kind of rule of thumb, you probably just want to turn this on most of the time because what it's going to do, it's going to take anything that may have dynamic subdivision, which is what we were using uh, in the previous stream where we talked about the Z modeler brush and using dynamic subdivisions. Uh, it'll take those, convert those dynamic subdivisions and then apply the Boolean. So this way, if this is on, uh, you're pretty much always gonna get what you see on screen. If you have this off and you have models that are using dynamic subdivision, it's not going to convert that dynamic. So you may end up with a result that has some meshes that look a little low res. So just one little thing there with this option. Now, after I have this turned on, I now can process this and the Boolean processes from the preview to real geometry like extremely fast. So you can send pretty much 10 million polygon DynaMesh models, sculpt the detail on them, cut something out of it, process with the Boolean, and it's gonna take you like a few seconds. Um, so if I come over here and click Make Boolean Mesh, this is now gonna process. And you'll see up at the top here, I have a new tool created that should have a prefix of UMesh attached to it. And if I select that, this is the result I'm getting. So now I have one subtool, and if I try to do that sculpting process across this edge here, you see it's gonna allow me to do it now because it's taken that live Boolean preview and it's converted to geometry. Now, one thing with the live Boolean preview, that's a big deal uh, inside of ZBrush, especially if you're doing toys, you know, anything that has a certain topology and you wanna add something else. So one example would be if I had an arm of a character and I wanted to separate, say, this part here so I can make a mold, right? So I could chop the arm off using the Boolean and then I need to add some sort of key element to it. Well, if I have this arm here and it's all fleshed out, nice and pretty, yada, 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 I don't want this to get destroyed. So I wanna add a key, but I don't wanna destroy this part. And so one thing nice about the live Boolean is that it's only going to change the topology where those intersections happen. So if I turn on my polyframes here, you can see that the topology is only changing where the intersections happen. So this topology right through here is the same topology I had on that initial ring. This topology through here is the same topology I had on the egg shape. And this topology through here is the same topology I had on the DynaMesh base ring, right? And the only areas that have changed are where these parts intersected. So this is huge when it comes into, you know, combining meshes and changing them because basically it's not gonna destroy the mesh you already have and it's only gonna change where those intersections happen. So if I go back to my ring and let me just append this part in here quick so you kind of see the difference here. And let's just turn off the live Boolean here and I'm just going to isolate that ring part. So here we have my ring. And so let's say I'm really happy with this topology. I had enough resolution. I did some crazy ornate details here. And then I process with the Boolean you're gonna see that none of that area where that ring was except where the intersections happened has changed. So this is a big deal in terms of it's gonna keep the topology constant. Now, if I did this process, say with DynaMesh, it's gonna change the entire volume of my topology, which could change some of those sculptural details. Maybe I had some edges that I really liked. Those could kind of get mushed or you know, eroded away. But if you use the live Boolean, it's gonna keep what you have and it's only gonna change at the intersection. So as an example of what the DynaMesh process would do, if I take this and say duplicate it, and let's DynaMesh that ring here quick. So I'm gonna come down here and click DynaMesh. 
you can see that it's changed this area through here. So I no longer have that came kind of like cylinder shape that I had originally. So this topology changed. So this is what it was before. And then this is with the new. So you can see this is what the DynaMesh process will do. So it's going to resurface your entire mesh. The Boolean is only going to happen or change where those intersections happen. So that's the big difference between using, say, uh, a DynaMesh subtraction process versus using the Boolean. And the Boolean is going to give you great results um, out of it, and it's also non-destructive. So if I decide, hey, this isn't what I wanted, I can always go back to my original parts, modify them again, get out of solo here, modify these, and then after I'm happy with that new change, so maybe I want something like this instead, I can now go to that tool palette, subtool, Boolean, make Boolean mesh. And now I have a new version of that with those changes. So it's very handy, non-destructive, and it's gonna allow you to just increase your workflows and keep trying stuff, experimenting things, and you're not really committed until you do that make Boolean mesh process. Um, why we're doing these things as well, you may wanna save during this time. And what I recommend doing if you're definitely new to ZBrush, just come up here and click and click save. And this will save everything that you currently have in your scene. Now to access these, say your next session while you're using ZBrush, you just wanna come up here and open Lightbox. And this will also open as you saw earlier when we were in, when we launched ZBrush, this opened up. And when it opens up, just navigate to this quick save folder here. And in here, any of those quick saves will be stored. And I can come over here and just simply double click and that will get you back to where you are. So first time users, definitely just keep hitting this quick save. You know, anytime you remember it, just come over and hit it. And as soon as you do it, it's gonna add a quick save there. And then when you come back in the Lightbox and go to that quick save folder, you'll see that uh, file there. So there's multiple ways to save inside of ZBrush, but the quick save is gonna be your easiest um, in terms of first time usage. So let's look at the uh, questions here. So am I using this with a tablet or a pencil or just a mouse? So I'm currently using a Wacom tablet here. So here I have a, an old Intuos um, and then I have my stylus. Um, you can use a pen, you can use a uh, mouse. The big thing with a pen or a sculpting device is that you're gonna have pressure sensitivity, which is gonna come into play when you're sculpting on your model. If you're doing things like I'm doing today, we're just moving around primitives, you can basically do that with the mouse uh, or the pen. You're not gonna have, you don't really need pressure sensitivity to do it. So it's um, gonna happen either way. Same thing with kind of like the Z modeler brush. You can definitely do a lot of that stuff with the mouse. Um, you can also do it with the pen, but unless you're sculpting, that's pretty much the primary thing uh, for pressure sensitivity and pen usage. Uh, uh, dynamic is asking is the way export increases from ZBrush as topology. So as topology, the crease options, um, you can, uh, you can use the Q grade process or maybe the way to go for that. You can export creases out. And if you have say something like 3 d Studio Max or Maya, it will respect those creases and you can do those with, um, the FBX format. So if you come to the Z plugin tab and export out with the where are you at? FPX export import, um, there's options where it will actually keep the creasing. Now, one thing with creasing inside of ZBrush, it's always gonna be on or off. So you're not gonna have a blend variable between the creasing. So if you export a mesh with creasing, um, it's gonna send it out as a one and a zero rather than say like a point value. And so once you get that into say a third party application that accepts the uh, creasing stuff, you can then change it in there to get your blends. Um, but the creasing will always come out as one and zero out of ZBrush. And FBX is the best way to get that creasing out. It's gonna be your primary format for that. Um, the other thing with uh, creasing as well, if you can, you can also export out as uh, with polygroups since polygroups is ZBrush is kind of like selection sets and you can come through and set all your areas to have different polygroups. So you can see this model, as I created it, uh, these different shapes generated my values and so I got different polygroup breakups across the surface here. So if you export this out, the polygroups will come over and you can then sometimes import them in as either separate files or as separate selection sets and then you can use creasing uh, based on that polygrouping in that third party application to get those creases back. Uh, Benjamin, so I definitely check out the, uh, I've done a few Zcrasm lives here since this whole uh, crazy uh, pandemic broke out. 
The first one I go through really quickly on very basic level, um, sculpting a bust. Uh, second uh, live one I did, I went through and generated a really ugly gazelle. Um, so <laughs> using uh, some of the Zizu option and Zizu mannequin files. Um, so there's definitely a, a bunch of those that have already been done. You can go back and rewatch them. We have them all up on YouTube. So if you just go to our YouTube channel, so just search for Pixelogic on YouTube and just do a search for Z Classroom Live, and that'll be the streams I'm doing um, as a developer. And they'll have the uh, sculpting a bust and using the Zizu will be the two ones that will kind of sculpt on or touch on the very basics of character sculpting. We'll go through navigation on those and then how to sculpt and edit your meshes. So I definitely say check that out. So Nab is asking at this stage, so now that I have this, what would I do with this now? So if I want to sculpt on this, you have a few different options. So we talked about uh, the creasing properties. So I can come down here and let's say I can activate dynamic subdivision. And you see this is giving me a decent result. I have some pinches through here, so I can scrub those out uh, like that. Um, I can also convert, say, this mesh to a DynaMesh now if I want even sculpting, sculpting abilities across the entire thing. So I can come over here to the tool palette. I can go to that geometry panel and go to the DynaMesh and I can DynaMesh this. And I'd probably want to up the resolution to say something like 512 and then I can apply a DynaMesh there and turn on my polyframes. You can also play with this blur after you apply DynaMesh and this will allow you to come through and kind of blur those edges out. There's a little white uh, circle here that'll allow you to give you more aggressive blur as well. So you can see now I can do this and it's gonna kind of smooth those edges out and give me like a little bit softer forms on my model. And at this stage, this mesh is 100% a DynaMesh model, so I could come in and start sculpting anywhere on it, and it's gonna allow me to do it. And I should get a consistent stroke all the way across. So that is uh, one option there. So after processing with the Boolean, you can just apply a DynaMesh, you can then change the blur sum to soften or bevel some of those edges, and then use just traditional sculpting uh, to get your results. The other thing you could do is we could run the Z remesher on it. So let's get back to my original here. Yeah, DynaMesh there. Undo. Got a bunch of undos here. And with the Z remesher, so right now I could come through and I could Z remesh this model, and this will come through and generate new quadded topology across the surface. So it's going to try to use quads as much as possible. This is a little bit different than DynaMesh. DynaMesh is just going to try to give you an even surface. Uh, ZRemesher is going to look at some of the curvature aspects of your mesh and it's going to try to give you nice curves along those edges. So I can come over here and say activate this keep groups option which is going to look at the divisions in these polygroup colors that I had from the original mesh. And I can now run ZRemesher on this. So you can see this is the mesh here. And we'll see how ZRemesher does on this. And this is the result I got from Zero Mesher there. So it went through and generated new topology. And you'll see that Zero Mesher, since I turned this keep groups option on, it looked at those edges that the Boolean system used or generated, and then it's cleaned those up. So this is what I had before. So you can see all those little triangles there. And now if I Zero Meshed, this is the result I get. So now I've gone through and basically just instantly retopologized the mesh and zero mesh was smart enough since those creases were really harsh where it was cutting the model. And now I have, you know, nice clean geometry um, for this page here. So using the Boolean and using zero mesh is another great thing to uh, use. And basically the same thing you want to probably work or use when using zero mesh is just using this keep groups option on um, and it'll come through. And if it's a Boolean mesh, it usually does a pretty good job because the Booleans are going to give these nice clean areas where zero mesh can find those really quick and go, Hey, that's, that's a good crease, and then it'll come through and add that edge there. And then after this is uh, zero meshed, I can now you know, sculpt on it like so, but my resolution may be a little bit low because zero mesh was made to kind of give you a lower topology. So this would be when you'd want to add your subdivisions to your mesh here. So I can come up here and click divide, and this would now divide that up. And so now I have a nice clean ring. I have subdivisions on it, and now I can come through and start sculpting on this as well. So those are the two options there I'd go through and you know use after I've generated my uh, Boolean mesh. And you can see you know that, that looks pretty good. <laughs> so you can definitely export that out, sculpt on it more, add some micro details. Um, if you ever want to see uh, crazy jewelry sculpting, uh, 
definitely check out Thomas Whittlebach. He is one of our uh, ZBrush live streamers as well. Turn into one of his channels and uh, he streams all the time. Um, there's a calendar if you go to ZBrushLive.com you can see when the streams are going to happen. But definitely pop into one of his streams and watch him sculpt some jewelry. Um, he's crazy and he gets really, really detailed. So this <laughs> poor example of a ring here um, is definitely nowhere to uh, his caliber. So if you're interested in doing any uh, jewelry sculpting inside of ZBrush, check out his channel. All right, so now we've gone through and we've used you know just the basic primitives here um, to generate our shapes. Now I wanna go into another thing that's it's kind of high level stuff, but it's gonna add a bunch of details and processes to your mesh while you're using the Boolean. And it's one of the cooler things that I think the Boolean can be, is used for and I use it all the time when I do stuff. And this is taking the model and then coming through and um, using an insert mesh brush. And with an insert mesh brush, I can select it to like a subtractive format and this will cut into the surface now and it's gonna allow me to get some really crazy uh, shapes out of it. So if I take this model here and actually we'll go back to this one. And let's say I have live Boolean active and there's a special brush that's inside a ZBrush. Let me move this keyboard out of the way. Actually, I need to put it, there we go. And it's already set up for this process. So what I wanna do is I wanna come over here to the subtool area and I just wanna make a dummy subtool. So I'm gonna click append and I am going to just get a cube 3D object and just select that. And then I'm gonna go to my subtool area over here, select that subtool. Now I'm gonna to switch to move, scale, or rotate, which is gonna give me that gizmo 3D. And I'm just gonna scale this down. And I want it, you know, pretty small and it can live in the middle of the ring here for now. That's a pretty good shape. And then I'm gonna set this subtool to subtractive. So you'll see, since that cube is in the middle of my mesh here and it's set to subtractive, I'm not really seeing anything, right? So it's not subtracting from any of the form, it's just kind of hanging out of zone, but it's set there, it's in the model, and it's set to subtractive. So now what I can do that I have this set up is I can come over here to the brush palette and open this up. And in here, there is a brush called the IMM model kit. Now inside of ZBrush to select brushes, there's a hotkey system, so you can hit B, which will open up this menu here. And then you can isolate by the next letter that the brush starts with. So if I hit I after I pressed B, and then you see it would isolate everything that began with I. And then if you hover over the brushes that begin with I, you'll see they have these little letters next to them. So hitting K would select the IMM model kit. So B, I, K would select this brush. Now with this brush, if I drag it out, actually this isn't the brush I want. Hold on, wait for it. <laughs> we want B, I, B, I, oh my gosh, keyboard, B, I, the Boolean, B, I, B. We don't want B, I, K, we want B, I, B. So remember that. So B, I, B, we'll select the IMM Boolean brush, which is the one we want. The model kit's great for uh, adding positive parts. So the last stream I did, one of the stream, last streams I did also made a robot out of IMM parts um, and I used just primarily that brush. So it's really good for adding different things there. So this is the IMM Boolean brush and at the top here when you load a brush that contains insert mesh parts or multi-parts, you'll see this little viewer at the top here. And if you come up here, you can scroll to select different ones. You can also press M on your keyboard, which will open up a little preview window here. And you can also select the parts here. So I'm gonna come through and say, select this uh, ball radar here and select that. And this is now set up as an IMM brush. So what that means is if I turn off live Boolean and I have a subtool selected, if I click on a model, this will take that part and it will draw it out, right? So it's basically gonna take this and it's gonna draw it out as another geometry island on the subtool I've selected and this will allow you to model with kind of this shape mode. So I can go in and just start adding these different parts. If I want a different one, I can select it up at the top, and now I can get that part. So you can go through and you can model entire objects. Uh, it's great for uh, greeble processes. If you're making a ship, it works really awesome. But basically all it is is just inserting this part. Now you'll see that these parts are looking a little bit funky as I draw them out. So if I go back to this one here, you can see it kind of has this weird shape. So if I activate solo, you can see it's doubled and then it's also kind of inverted, right? 
So this brush is set up as an IMM brush, but it's set up to draw negatively. So it's going to draw subtractive shapes. Now, since I have this tool set to subtractive, if I come back and turn solo on and activate the live Boolean, if I now draw out on this tool that's already set to subtractive, it's gonna draw that IMM part out and then it's gonna subtract it already. So if I come across the surface here and draw this out, you see it's gonna take that IMM part and then subtract it from the surface. So if I go back up here and say select that crazy radar one, click and drag, I now get this shape cut into my model. And this is all just taking an IMM brush and as I draw it out, it's cutting to the form. So this will work with any instant mesh brush, but the ones with the Boolean are set up so you can see the preview of it and also draw it out. Because basically you want to draw out in reverse to how you would normally create an instant mesh brush because you want to cut into the surface rather than add to the surface. So it's really fun to come through and turn on a symmetry here and I can start adding these different parts. You can add them to anything. So I can add to like the curved surface over here. And you can see just with a few clicks, I can come and add different ones. You can start playing with the designs and shapes of your model, right? So now I've got a really happy ring. He's so happy. <laughs> and all I'm doing is taking this brush and adding elements to it. Now you can make these large or small too. So if you want to make drastic changes across the surface of your mesh, you can definitely do that. So as you draw this out, you know, all it's doing, it's drawing this IMM part out and I have it on this tool, it's already set up subtractive, so it's cutting through. So we had a question earlier about uh, designing a kind of a mech character and there was a image. And so this is the way you can kind of get those little details on your model. So you just make a brush basically, or use this one. And as you draw it out, you see it's cutting into that surface, right? And so this will allow you to add you know, intricate noise and stuff effects to your model. So if instead of doing say surface noise or sculpting, I can just take these insert mesh parts and start carving into the model. And so now I've generated this effect. Now, if I look at this tool and turn it on, you can see this is what it looks like. It's craziness, right? So it's just all these insert mesh parts that are all gobbled together. But when they're applied in Boolean fashion, you start to get some cool stuff. Now, this can also all go into a traditional mesh. So right now it's all Boolean. If I don't like any of these parts, to so say I added, you know, maybe a little bit too many, maybe I don't want this one here. These are all set up with these uh, poly groups. So as I drew them out, they gave me uh, different grouping on them. So if I don't want one of these, I can remove them as well. So I can hold down Control and Shift to select it. Um, if you see a part that has multiple poly grouping, you can then isolate by that geometry island. So it's a little advanced. Um, but if you hold Control Shift and A, it'll give you the entire uh, geometry island. And so now I have this part just isolated. And then I can say, flip the visibility by holding controlling shift and dragging off. And then I'll only give me, so I basically remove that part. And then I can delete that so it's no longer there. So I go to the tool, geometry, modify topology area and do delete hidden, which will delete that hidden part of the mesh. And now if I get out of solo, you can see that part's now been removed. Uh, we have one question about the increasing the depth of the Boolean. So you can. So after you draw it out, it is going to give you that part unmasked. So let's say I grab this part here and I drag this out. And now I want that to be deeper. So right now, just think of it as a normal insert mesh brush or a normal piece of geometry. So if I get out solo, you can see this is what I have. So as I drew it out, it gave me this as an unmasked part. So now you just need to modify that shape. So I'm going to switch to the Gizmo 3D. It should put the gizmo close to where your model is. If not, you can hold Alt and click and it'll center it back on that part. Now I can scale this. And if I scale it this direction, what is it doing? It's changing the shape of that, which is going to increase the depth in which it's cutting into that surface. So if I turn off solo and apply that transformation with scale, you can see now I'm making that carve in more or less. So the depth that the IMM is gonna carve into your mesh is all gonna relate it to the part itself. So you can use move or transform or different uh, processes and that's gonna determine how that cut's gonna happen. Because all it is is just a piece of geometry that's just being seen as subtractive. And you're just changing the shape of it and that's gonna allow you to cut it in more or cut it in less, make it shallower, make it deeper. Um, it's all up to you in terms of uh, what do you wanna do there after you draw it out. So if I want these to be deeper, you know, I can come back. I just have this whole tool selected. Everything's, or a whole sub tool selected, everything's unmasked. So if I move this, you now see it's gonna cut through that surface and change that. So I can definitely get these a little bit deeper. 
I can then scale these. Now, once again, everything is unmasked. So as I'm scaling here, these are going to get deformed too. But you can see now I can come through and add you know, those elements in different parts of the model. And this is all in preview mode. So none of this is happening. Like It's not destroying your mesh. It's all non-destructive at this stage. So if you make a big change or you rotate something and then you decide, oh, I don't really like that, you can always undo and get it back to where it was. So now that we have something like this, we can come through and now generate topology out of that. So same process, come back over here. We're gonna go to our uh, top subtool here that's creating the hierarchy of the Booleans. We're gonna go down the Boolean area and we're gonna click Make Boolean Mesh. Now before I click this Make Boolean Mesh, we're gonna hit on this dynamic subdivision again. So I'm gonna go back to my cube. And here you'll see that these parts, when I drew them out, they're a little bit uh, low res, right? So they're not coming in as crisp. And the brushes, or the parts that are in this IMM Boolean brush, are set up to use dynamic subdivision. And so what that means is if I locate that subtool that I've selected with that cube, and I come down to the geometry area and go to the dynamic subdivision area and turn on dynamic, you'll see as soon as I turn this on, they're gonna get nice and smooth. So dynamic subdivision is gonna give you the ability to have a low resolution model and preview it as it had high subdivision levels. And this is handy for keeping your files really lightweight you can change the subdivision level here. It's gonna make your ZBrush flow a little faster, but then you'll be able to see what it would look like if it had high resolution. So these parts here for this IM Boolean, IMM Boolean brush are set up to use this dynamic. And so you can see as I toggle this on and off, those parts are gonna get nice and smooth. So now if I go back to my ring, you can see with dynamic on, look how uh, smooth uh, those parts are there. Let me go back and select that. I messed something, there we go. So you see they're nice and smooth now. I'm getting really nice round results. And if I turn dynamic off, this is what I had before. So just a little thing there with dynamic. So now that dynamic comes into play when processing the Boolean. So if I go back up to my top tool here and I'm ready to process the Boolean, if I have this dynamic turned off, it's gonna give me that rough result from that shape. So even though it looks nice and smooth here, this is the dynamic process. So if I don't have this turned on, ZBrush is gonna ignore that dy dynamic process. So you want to make sure dynamic is on if you're using dynamic. And then when I click make billion mesh, this will process this. And you can see once again how long that took. It was seconds. So I was hoping to get a quick drink of water here. <laughs> and that's the result there. All right. <clears throat> and so once again, if I turn on my polyframes here and turn on line, you can see the topology only changed where the intersections happened. So this whole part here with that sphere, that's all the original topology on that sphere. This part here for the ring, all the original topology. These little line things here, all the original topology. The only thing that's changing is where those parts intersect. So now I've taken that Boolean there and now I have this kind of ring design. And for the most part, if you're dealing, the live Boolean will also always require you in order to use it, um, you'll have to have watertight meshes. And so what this means is if the mesh is watertight and you apply it with the Boolean, it's gonna stay watertight. And so most of these things that you do inside of ZBrush using the Booleans, since they already started watertight when you're making the elements, um, you can just directly 3D print them because they're already ready to go. So stuff like this is uh, easy to make, just modifying it using those different parts and now we have a result. Uh, let's look at these questions here. Uh, let's see here. Oh man, there's a whole bunch in here. Uh, so Ram was asking about the, uh, how to remesh it. So we talked about earlier, uh, you can use DynaMesh. Um, and so the one example through here was, uh, this was, where are we at? Let me find that here. This was a, uh, well, one option you have for taking the topology after it's been processed with the Boolean is you can do something, say, with the uh, Z-Remesher. So this was a, zero mesh version of the first one I did here and you can see the topology it gave me for that and then after you have the zero mesh version you can divide it up uh, when you use zero mesher if you're going that route make sure you keep that keep groups on and they'll come through and allow you to uh, keep those poly groups uh, the other option would you just be dynamesh and so if I go back to my one here so that was the boolean result and I duplicate that now if you dynamesh this it will go through and give you that even surface too so let me just do that quick. And one thing with the Dynamesh is this polish or blur slider here. You can change this and that will also 
take that result and clean it up and then you can sculpt on it. So those are the two kind of things I'd say recommend if you need to um, go in and process or sculpt on it after you use a lot of Boolean. So you can use a Z remesher with keep groups or you can apply DynaMesh and then after you DynaMesh, I'd say adjust the uh, blur slider here. There's a little white circle that will give you a more aggressive blur and just use that um, and you'll be able to get a result. So that's usually the two ways I go and the Z remesher will usually do a pretty good job um, on giving you new topology. So this, this one did a really good example here. It got all those lines and then with subdivisions, it looks really good. So um, Michael's asking, can you shell the model? So you can shell the model using DynaMesh. You could also uh, duplicate the model and use the Booleans to kind of get an inner shell on the mesh as well. So as an example of that, with this uh, subdivided ring here, I'm just gonna duplicate it so I have a secondary one. I'm gonna take the secondary one and say, turn it subtractive. Now you'll notice that the model vanishes kind of right now because both of these objects are sitting in the same thing. So I, same space. So I took that one mesh that I uh, zero meshed and divided, and then I duplicated it. So I have a secondary one, but they're sitting on top of each other. So it's canceling out. So what I want to do with the secondary one is I can go to move scale and rotate, and I can start scaling this down and maybe scale it out. And you can see how this is giving me that hollow shape too. So now I've come through and done this. And that is now one way you can go through and hollow out like a surface. This ring is pretty simple um, in order to do because it doesn't really have too many complex volumes. So all I'm doing is taking a duplicate version of it and then scaling it in basically two directions. And you see I'm going to get that shell type format. And then after that, you're done with that shell. You can reprocess this as the Boolean. Uh, the Boolean system will also only look at what's visible. So if I have this one off down here, it's going to ignore it. So now we'll process this and this. So I can come down here and click make Boolean mesh. And this is going to process. And after that's processed, I'll have a new result up here. Let me find it. And this is the, well, I should have a new result. I think I did something. Let me rename this. Try that again. And now I have this, and this is the geometry version of that. So that is now taking the Boolean. I've just done that little shell process there, and this is the final geometry for it. Now, if I turn on my polyframes, you can see this is pretty dense um, because I had that subdivided Z remesher topology, but you'll see that it's only going to change the topology where that intersection happened. So you're going to get a nice clean intersection. But this was a pretty uh, simple one in terms of kind of getting a hollowed type form out of it. If you have more advanced stuff, you'd have to probably move the surfaces a little bit. Um, you can use inflates as well down here in the deformation palette. There's some inflate options in here. You can mess with those to also kind of get that volume you have and shrink it down to give you a cavity. Um, uh, the other way to do a shelling process is uh, with DynaMesh, um, and that will allow you to come through and create a shell using DynaMesh. But if you can get away with it with the Boolean, the Boolean is going to give you a nice, nicer result on that shell. So one thing there for you for hollowing. Let's see. Can you use a ray mesh? James is asking, can you use a ray mesh with Boolean? By all means, yes, you can. A ray mesh will work with the Booleans. So ray mesh is a little more high level than I want to get in here today. Um, Paul, if he does another stream, you can ask him about ray mesh. He, he loves showing a ray mesh in Booleans. It's like his favorite thing. So definitely check that. Uh, one question here, why is there so many IMMs? Do they do different things or is it all the same but with different brushes? So the IMMs basically are just going to contain different parts. So if you think if you just have like different pieces of geometry and they're all different. Um, so like this one has just uh, body parts in it. So it's heads and arms. This one has clothing parts, so buckles, uh, buttons. This one's curves for straps. Um, this one has a bunch of gun parts. Uh, so just, they vary on what kind of geometry is in them. The uh, IMM model kit is one of the larger ones here um, in ZBrush. And this has a little, kind of little pieces of uh, model stuff that you need to make like uh, say Gundams or things like that. So it's made of all these little parts. So these are primitives or half primitives. So this one has holes in them right here. So you wouldn't want to use the IMM uh, primitives H for your Boolean processes since those would not be watertight, it wouldn't process. But that's all basically they are. They're just different 
uh, pieces. And you can find a lot of uh, brushes online too that people have made their own ones. Um, and you can use those to kind of get a hard start on modeling, use them. Uh, there's some really good ones you can find uh, that have like breaking down in like hands and then you have like heads and torsos and arms and you can quickly just take those and draw them out and get an entire character in a few seconds. And then after you have that done, you can then use the Boolean to say, merge it all together to make one mesh and then sculpt on it. So there's a lot of different avenues. Um, so just customizing uh, for the IMM part stuff there. Let's see what else. So uh, Tropical is asking, will ZBrush deny the Boolean operation if the mesh isn't suitable? Yes, it will uh, give you an error and tell you that the mesh cannot be modified. Uh, oftentimes when it does this, it will dump a file up here and then you can use a process inside of ZBrush to test the errors. Uh, if you want more information on this, if you go to the Z Classroom site, so this is uh, Pixelogic Z Classroom, and do a search for live boolean. There is a whole uh, series here on uh, live boolean fixing errors, and this will go through that process in this step. So it'll show you, here's a mesh, there's an example mesh that breaks, and then um, how you can fix it using the live boolean. So there's a series of checks if it fails, and then you go in and find where those issues are on your mesh, fix those, and then reprocess again. So there's a whole uh, Z Classroom video on that to go over that. Um, 12 is asking, he's talking about, is there a way to hide this? So we'll hit that again. So yes, uh, anytime you select an IMM brush or a Z modeler brush, you're gonna get this little bar at the top. This is the IMM preview bar. If you don't want this to uh, show up, you can go to preferences. Let me move my keyboard here. You can go to preferences and then I'm following his directions here because I can remember the <laughs> last one. And then IMM viewer. And in here you have an auto show hide. And if you turn this off, it will hide it. You also have the ability to change its location. So if you don't want it always on top, you can move it to the side or even the bottom. Um, it'll scroll away around just by changing that placement. But if you don't want to show up when you select uh, an IMM brush, you can just turn that off. Now, as we talked about earlier with the IMM brushes, select a part, you can use this to select. You can also press M on your keyboard, which will pop up this window and you can select that way as well. So if you had the preference interface show hide turned off and you want to select another part in that IMM brush, you can just press M and then select that part and then now you can go on your model and add it. Uh, <clears throat> so Rio is asking to connect pieces, which is the best, Boolean DynaMesh or Zero Mesh as far as holding details. So the connecting pieces, you are gonna have to either use DynaMesh or Boolean. Zero Mesh isn't gonna do any model connection, it's just gonna give you new topology. So if your meshes are separate and you run Zero Mesh, they're gonna stay separate. Um, when using the Boolean, you have another option you can use as well. The uh, primary one, let's say if I wanna go in, let's go back to, let's grab this, and then let's append in cube. I'm just going to move the cube. So let's say I have this, right? So I have two subtools here and I want to connect them, right? So I can use uh, DynaMesh to do this. To do that, I would come in and say, select this tool. I need to merge these together uh, to make one subtool. So I'd come down to the, oh, let me make this a polymesh first. And now let's append in a cube. There we go. So the, if it's not a poly mesh object, it would not let me uh, do that. So basically, I first need to merge these together. So I can go to the merge option here. I can take one subtool and merge it into another. And so I can do a merge down. Now this will look like it joined it, but these are still separate pieces of geometry. So the merge inside of ZBrush, the subtool merge, is only gonna take the subtools and merge them together. It's gonna keep them separate, but it's gonna merge them together. Now, if I want to join these, you have uh, a few options. So we could use DynaMesh. So if we go to the geometry area here and DynaMesh this, you can see now it's going to DynaMesh and now it's going to take those models where they insect, it's going to DynaMesh it and give me one surface. Now this is going to give you even topology everywhere. So you can see this is all together and this shape wouldn't be too bad, DynaMesh together, but you'll see it's changed the topology entirely. So if I undo this, this is what I had and say I really liked the topology on this cube if you DynaMesh it, it's gonna change everything. So you see it changed the entire surface there. So another way to do that would be using the Boolean. So if I do a group split on this, I can go to my sphere. We can then go to the Boolean operation, make sure I have live Boolean turned on. 
I have both of these set to positive, so they're doing this union uh, process here. And then I'm gonna click Make Billion Mesh. It's gonna process that, give me a new tool at the top. And now I have this. And so the Boolean has gone through, it's welded those two parts together, and it's changed the geometry only where those parts intersected. So you can see my box still has that same topology. Now the third way to do this is if I came through and merged these guys together, this is high level, <laughs> is, oh, is what I can do is I can activate a deformer and there's a, there's a Boolean deformer. Uh, so remesh by union is what it's called. So to get to deformers, I can just switch to move, scale, or rotate, which will give me the Gizmo 3D. If I click this customize button here, in here I have a bunch of different deformers I can apply. Some of these are lattices, some of these are like bend curves. So they're handy to come in here and you know select one of these, then you can deform the entire subtool you have selected. Now the one in here that's called remesh by union is gonna do that Boolean process, but it's gonna do it on a single subtool. So if you went through and merged a whole bunch of stuff together, and now you wanna remesh by union, which is gonna take all those parts and where they collide, it's gonna intersect them and perform that Boolean process. Uh, so this is handy if you have you know, a whole bunch of stuff tucked together and you just wanna merge everything together and have it all nice and welded and all one single mesh. So if I take this and now do remesh by union, it's gonna process. And you can see it's gonna give me the exact same thing I was getting from doing that live Boolean process, except instead of me having multiple subtools, it's gonna do it on one subtool. So uh, that's the third process there, and that's using the customize remesh by union deformer that's located in the Gizmo 3D. So that's a little high over there, but there was a question on it. Um, so I figured it answered quick. Uh, so we're getting a question about making patterns of booleans. Yes, by all means, uh, you could definitely use a ray mesh to get some patterns. Uh, you could use nano mesh too. I'm not going to go into those today, but basically you could create a nano mesh surface. Uh, there's actually some acid ZBrush videos on using nano mesh. Uh, let's see here. Let's see if I can find that one quick. It should be up at the top here. Maybe, maybe not, maybe not. But um, if you do a search for acid ZBrush and Boolean and nano mesh, there's one where I'll go through and take a nano mesh surface, apply it to a mesh, and then use it to cut it out of another mesh. And that gives some really cool details too, because basically nano mesh will allow you to take one of those insert mesh parts and you apply it to every polygon on the model. And then you get these weird kind of shapes out of it. And then you can use those in subtractive form, just like we're doing with the IMM Boolean, and it'll cut into the surface. So some cool stuff there too. All right, so I've got one more main thing I wanna hit in this video on the Boolean, and that is how to set up one of these uh, kind of brushes for use with uh, the Boolean process. So you saw with these parts here, um, when I was using them, they're kind of set up weird as in they're double-sided. So they had one side that was kind of cutting and then another side. So I just wanna show the process of how you can make these really easy because thinking about stuff negatively is sometimes very hard. So if you want to add a cut in shape, you know, you can sit there and you, your brain can kind of stumble on this, but if you kind of analyze it, it's pretty simple to do. So I want to show a, a quick process on that. So this is going to hit on some of the stuff we did with Z modeler in the last episode too. So I'm going to use the Z modeler brush with a cylinder. I'm going to make a shape and then I'm going to get that to set up at, be set up as an IMM Boolean part. So I'm going to go through that real quick. All right. So first for this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Lightbox. Now, once again, if you want to save anything you have, just hit quick save. It'll save it out. I don't think I'll be going back to these files, but you never know. You never know. So now I have a version of it in here. So I'm going to go to the project tab here. And for any time I usually start using the ZMLA brush, I usually grab this primitives ZPR file here. So I'm just going to grab that quick. And then I'm going to click no to saving my scene there. And this is going to come in with a bunch of different tools here. And these are set up to be used with uh, Z modeler. So they have some creasing set, they're ready to go for use with dynamic, and then you can just use the Z modeler brush on them and start generating shapes. So I wanna generate a sh quick shape here, and it's one of the shapes I kinda like doing. So I'm gonna take this cylinder with the inner loops, and the inner loops just stand for that has this ring on both sides, so it has a ring there and a ring here. And now I'm gonna activate the Z modeler brush, and so this can be done by going to the brush palette over here, and then locating the Z modeler brush right there. Let me move my keyboard out here. And so I'm gonna select the Z modeler brush. 
With the Z Modeler brush selected, this is a context sensitive brush. So what this means is if you hover over an edge, a poly or a point, you're gonna be able to apply different actions to your model. Uh, the last series of stuff, I did a tire using this process. If you want more information on that, there's a whole uh, live on that. And then on Z Classroom, there's a video covering every single little functionality of the Z Modeler brush too. So a lot more information on that uh, you can find on Z Classroom. So with this, I want to design kind of a little loop shape that maybe has a little indent cut. So something simple, not too crazy, but I want to use this to subtract from other models. So say I want to generate it and then say take like the demo anime head or something and cut into that surface using this brush. So I just want to make a part that I can then reuse, make a brush out of it and have it set up for that subtractive process. So the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna model this really quick. And one of these things I kind of like doing to generate an oval shape is I'll mask off part of it um, and then use the gizmo kind of extrude functionality to kind of pull it up. And this will give me this nice oval shape and it's gonna have these nice uh, topology to it. So I start with the primitive and I'm gonna hold down the control key, which is gonna give me the mask rectangle brush. And I just wanna mask off part of this here. So something like that. And now if you have it masked, if I switch to the gizmo and move, you'll see I'm gonna be able to move part of the mesh here, but it's gonna keep that masked part masked. So I'm protecting that area with masking. Now with the Gizmo 3D Active, I'm gonna hold down Control and I'm gonna click and drag. And if I did this right, let's flip my mask in there. And if I do it right, I'm gonna get this shape, okay? So what I did here is I'm gonna mask out and the masking will process based on the vertices. So if I come through here and I cover my mask, so holding Control, you press space button to move this. And if you cover across a point, that is what is getting masked. So it's not the faces, it's the points. So you wanna make sure that when you're doing this, you're masking the points is what you gotta remember you're doing and that's gonna give you the mask. And so when you're dealing with like high polygon models and you're doing the masking, you're not really gonna notice it because there's so many polygons. But if you're dealing with low res stuff, remember that it's masking based on the points, not the faces. So just one little thing there. So now that I have this part masked and this part unmasked, I can now switch to the gizmo. And if I hold down control and use the move option, it's going to perform this extrude function. And what this is doing, it's taking the unmasked parts and extruding them out. And this will allow me to get this kind of nice shape. So this is a handy one uh, for creating little intricate details for mechs and things like that. It's kind of one of my go-tos and it's really simple to do because all you're doing is taking a cylinder, masking part, pulling it out and you know, I got this. Now with this, what I have is now I can add some more details to this. And to do this, I'm going to use a, uh, the insert mesh or the Z modeler insert edge loop option. So I wanna add say a ring around here. So I'm just clicking and dragging to add a little element there. I wanna kind of pop this up. So I have one that's kind of raised. So I wanna do like something that's like tapered on the inside and then maybe have this middle part having angled in. And as I'm modeling this, I'm modeling it how I want it to cut out of the mesh. So I'm modeling it as how I want it to be when it's on the model. So that's the thing here, I'm modeling it positively. I'm not really thinking about negatively right now, I'm just modeling the shape, how I want it to look when it's on the mesh. So I wanna extrude this part out. So I'm gonna come over this edge and I'm gonna press spacebar to go in the Z modeler edge action menu. Once again, there, if you watch the last stream, this will make sense. If uh, not, then maybe a little bit high level. Um, so with this, I wanna switch to the polygroup option here and I'm gonna change my modifiers to overwrite. And I'm just gonna click and just press alt until I get a polygroup that I can see. Now polygrouping inside of ZBrush will allow you to isolate different parts of your mesh really easy. You can use this for visibility purposes. Um, you can also use this with the Z modeler brush to control different processes. So now I wanna extrude this up. So I'm gonna come across one of these polys on this edge here. I'm gonna press spacebar and go in the Z modeler poly action menu. We get one you can actually see that's not keyboard clipping. Oh, keyboard, put you up here. And now in here, I'm gonna set the target to polygroup all. And this is going to use that polygroup that I just established to that nice edge loop there. And when I perform this action, it's gonna extrude it out. This is the Q mesh action here. So as this pulls out, it's going to apply this extrude and it's a smart extrude. So if I have areas in my model that are near it, it would perform a weld. Uh, since there's nothing really in this vicinity, as I pull it out, I'm just gonna get this shape. So now I have that. Now the next thing I wanna do is I wanna do the same thing to this part here. But as I do this, I wanna click and drag. And as I'm dragging out performing that Q mesh action, I'm gonna hold shift and shift's gonna give me a move instead of an extrude. So now I can get this kind of shape to it. And I wanna pump it out just a little bit like that. So now I've got something like this. 
Now you'll notice the bottom here went too because it had the same poly group. I'm not really concerned about this at the moment, so I'm just gonna ignore that. I'm really just focusing on the shape itself up here. So what it's gonna look like when it's applied to a mesh. So I want this kind of popping out. May wanna add some uh, edges in here maybe and add maybe a little detail around this edge too. So I'm just gonna play with this a little bit more. So I'm gonna come through and hover over another edge, press space bar, go to the edge action menu, and choose insert and single edge loop this time. Since I still have this nice edge loop here, I can add edges pretty easily. It's going to go right where I want them. So I can add that there and say add one in here maybe like that. I may want to add this a little more intricate. So I'm going to add that edge there and then push this part in. So I'm going to hover over an edge again, go in that edge action menu, choose that polygroup option again. You'll see that I switch a lot between insert and polygroup and this just allows me to quickly come in and you know, establish new polygrouping to an area really quick. And then I can use that Q mesh just to affect that part. You see now I can drive that in and now I'm getting that shape on my mesh. So now that I have this, it's looking pretty good. Let's set up some creasing really quick so I can get areas when I apply that dynamic subdivision, it smooths it out. So if I turn off my polyframes, you can see I have some rough edges. So I want to apply creasing to the mesh. So I do this with the tool palette. I'm going to go down to the geometry area and open up the dynamic subdivision area here. I'm going to activate dynamic. This is the result I'm getting there. Now with this, you can see some areas are looking okay. So the initial shape had creasing, but you see it didn't go all the way across. So I have some nice edges here and then it gets a little bit crazy. So I'm going to reset all the creasing on this. So I'm going to geometry and go to the crease area. And then in here, I'm going to click uncrease all, which is going to uncrease everything. And then I'm gonna try creasing by 45 degrees. So it's gonna look at the angle values of my mesh. It's gonna look at the slider here and determine what angles I should apply a crease to. And then click crease on that. And you can see now I have that result. So it's gone through and now I have some harsh edges going through there. So that's looking better, similar to what I'm looking for. Now you notice the back of the mesh is still a little bit crazy there. So still not worried about that. We're gonna let that go for now. So now that I have the shape here, I can continue modeling this if I want. If I want to add more details to it, want to add different elements, may want to, you know, add some beveled edges so I can come in and say, maybe I want to bevel this edge a little bit. So I'm going to come across this edge here, select the bevel process, make sure I have edge loop complete, just add a little bevel there, and then I can check it by turning on dynamic again. So that softened that up. So now I have a harsh edge and a soft edge. I can maybe soften this one too. There we go, just a little bit, eh, let me keep it harsh. And so now I have that. So now what I wanna do is if I create this as an insert mesh, it's gonna create this part. And I can get this and I can add it positively to my shape. But what I wanna do is I wanna take this part and when I apply it, I wanna have this cut into the surface of the model and give me this result. So I wanna cut into the mesh and get this. So what I wanna do with this is I wanna generate the negative of this form. So what it would look like if you cut through it. Now to do this, it's very simple. You just need to think about it in a different way. Well, you know, I could have gone through and modeled it negatively, but that's, my brain doesn't wanna go there. My brain knows what it wants and it doesn't wanna model it negatively. Negatively is not what I'm used to. So I can't really, you know, figure it out on the fly. It's gonna take me a lot of time. So if you do this, basically you're taking the mesh and you're just generating it positively and you're generating the exact result you want. And now all I have to do is take this mesh and kind of invert it, right? So I'm gonna invert the mesh, basically turn it inside out. So it's like, there's all those like cartoons back in the day where you had someone that was running around and all of a sudden they got inverted, you know? So it's the same process we're gonna do here. We're just doing it digitally. So I'm gonna to come to the back here and I'm just gonna hold control and I'm just gonna mask out this back part just mask that entire area out. Um, I could also do a, uh, a selection kind of mask too. So if I mask it out, I can flip it by holding control, which would give me this part uh, masked and this part unmasked. I can also, if I have nothing selected and hold down control and alt, this will give me a white box instead of a black box. And this will do a mask unmask process. So it's going to mask everything that's not in this area here. So this is a little bit faster. I still do the other way too, but if I'm teaching people uh, how to do this, they should probably do it this way because it's a lot quicker. So basically holding down Control and Alt and basically selecting the area you want to be unmasked and then the rest of the parts will be masked. And you notice, again, once since that the masking is based on that, you'll see that you can see this area is kind of masked out and this one's got a little bit of gradient through there, but this is the fully masked part and that's the unmasked. So I'm gonna activate the Gizmo 3D 
And I'm gonna click the little go to unmasked mesh center. I could also use the hotkey we set up earlier, which was J, get that back over there. And now I wanna take this and I wanna flip it. So I'm gonna drag this across and do that, right? So now I've taken the mesh and I've turned it inside out. Now that the mesh is inside out, this is looking a little bit weird, right? So what I wanna do now is I wanna flip it again. And this time I'm gonna flip the normals of every single face on this mesh. So for this, I'm gonna come over here to the tool palette. I'm gonna go all the way down to the display area, display properties, and I'm gonna click flip. And that is now taken that mesh. I've just flipped it upside down basically. So I took that one edge and I ran it through. So it went inverted and then I flipped the faces. So now I've taken that shape and I've now generated the negative for it. And that took a few seconds. So instead of going in and me trying to model this like this negatively, I modeled it positively. And now I've taken that shape and then just flipped it. And so now I have this, right? And this is the part that if I press it into the model, it's gonna give me that Boolean result I'm looking for. So with this now, you can see I have this side looking how I want. And on this side, I want it to look you know, the same. So I can see what I'm going to drag out on the mesh. Now the process to do this is fairly simple too. So since I have this kind of buffer in the middle here, I can use a mirror and weld process and it'll take this side that's already good and then just mirror it over the other side. So I'm going to align this and then go up here to the geometry tab. So tool, I'm gonna close my sub tool palette here in a second and go to modify topology. So tool, geometry, modify topology. And in here is a mirror and weld. Now, if I mirror and weld this currently, it's gonna do it in the X axis, which is actually this direction like this. So it'll take this side and flip it over there. I wanna do it based on Z. So I'm gonna come over here and activate Z, turn off X. Now, it may take you a few times to figure out which axis is the correct one. You can also rotate your model and get it to where it needs to be. Um, but if you don't uh, have the mirror and weld working correctly, you can always undo. So you can see here, I did the mirror and weld and it did it based on the uh, world axis. So what that means is if I turn on the floor here, you can see this was the uh, Z axis here, going across like this. And it took what was over here and mirrored it to the other side. Well, I don't want my mesh to look like this. I want it to be the same. So I want to actually mirror it down the middle of itself. So to do this, I just need to come over here and activate this local symmetry. So this is going to change the symmetry from using the world symmetry, which is here in the middle, and then it's going to use the local symmetry, which is the symmetry based on the bounding box of the sub tool I have selected. So if I come over here and activate local symmetry and now click mirror and weld, that's going to process and I'm going to get this result. Now you'll see that this did it <laughs> in the direction I didn't want to do it, but basically it gave me what I was looking for. So I'm going to undo that quick. I'm now going to come to the deformation area here, mirror in Z, and now make sure I have local symmetry on. Now do mirror and weld. Now I'm going to get this result. And you see I now have that object with a front and back face that look exactly the same. Now if I activate my dynamic subdivisions now, this is the result I should be getting here. So that looks pretty good. And you can see if I look at it this way or look at it this way, it looks exactly the same. So now I've set up my part. I've made it in positive view. I've flipped it inside out. I've now mirror and welded it so I can see what it looks like on both sides. Okay. So now I just need to create an insert mesh brush to use with the Boolean. Now the easiest way to do this is just first position your model how you want it to draw out. So if I want this to model to draw out like this, I just position it like this on my canvas. It can be anywhere on the canvas. Just make sure it's positioned in the right angle. After you have it positioned, I'm just going to come over to the brush palette over here. I'm going to go to the create menu and I'm going to click create insert mesh. And this is going to look at what I have selected, the sub tool I've selected, and it's going to create a new brush, a new insert mesh brush out of it. Now, if I had multiple subtools and multiple parts, then this insert multi mesh option would light up, and that would allow me to process multiple subtools and then use those as different parts in that brush. And for right now, I just have one piece, so I'm going to click create insert mesh. This is now going to ask me if I want a new or append to the existing one. Well, since I have a Z model brush, I do not want that, so I'm going to click new. And now I should have a new insert mesh brush selected. Now, if you have the preferences, IMM viewer, show hide on, this should now pop up there and you should see that part. Now you'll notice that when you view it in this bar here, you can be able to now tell what it is. 
If I didn't do that back side there, I'd get a view of this model where I wouldn't be able to see the other side because the side I'd want to use is down here. So it's the back face of it, right? And the IMM preview is always going to show you what you're looking at, right? So if you draw it out, that's what it's going to look at. But since I'm setting these up negative, I want to make sure I have both sides of that model there so I can tell what that part is. So now that I have this, now I'm going to go and say select a mesh to mess with this floor. So let me just uh, copy my tool here so I don't lose that. If at any time you want to kind of copy things into memory really quick, you can use this copy button. This will allow you to open up another project inside of ZBrush, and then you can paste that tool back into it. So a little handy thing there. So I'm going to go in the project tab here. I'm going to go to the project area. I'm going to select the anime head and double click that. And then I'm going to paste in that tool I was working on just so I don't lose it. And now with the anime head here, I want to take this Boolean that I just generated and I want to use it. Okay, so we're going to do that same process we did before. So I have Live Boolean active. I currently only have one subtool, so I need to add a secondary subtool to actually get the Live Boolean to start working. So I'm going to come over here, I'm going to click Append, I'm going to select the Cube 3D again, and I'm going to activate the Cube 3D or select it, switch to the gizmo, I'm going to scale it down, and I'm just going to put it in the middle of the head. You could also move it off in space. Um, it just doesn't really matter. It's just a temporary point of reference for this mesh here. You can delete it later after you've added parts. Now that I have this, I'm going to set that subtool to subtractive. You should see the cube vanish since it is in subtractive and I have live boolean active. And now I want to select my part here, my insert mesh brush. And now if I draw this out, what I'm doing is I'm drawing it out on the cube subtool that's set to subtractive. So as I draw this out on the surface, Wait for it. Let me make sure it's working. It should be working. What happened? What did I break? Hold on. Hold on. What did I break? What did I break? Let's save this out. <laughs> so what happens when you're live? All right, one thing here I want to check. Wait for it, wait for it. Ah, okay, that's what I thought. All right, so I have my tool, the cube, gone through, set it small, set it subtractive. Now I'm gonna go and I'm gonna draw this out. So I'm gonna draw it on the head and what it's doing, it's gonna add it to the cube. And let me get back to where this was. Now you'll notice, when I draw this out initially, nothing has happened. So if I turn on my cube, the part's there, it's coming through, but I'm not getting it to cut in the surface. And this is because by default, when you create an instrument brush, it assumes that you're always gonna want that piece on top of the surface. And so what you need to do is you need to go in and you need to modify the depth in which that instrument mesh part's gonna come out at. Now I could do it manually by using move scale or rotate, but what I can do for this brush, then go to the brush area here. I can open up the depth area, and in here we have an embed value. Now the embed value initially is gonna be calculated by the bounding box of the part that you just turned into an insert mesh. So it's gonna go from zero to whatever the height of that part is. So this one's default when I went in here was 97. So what we want is we want this IMM part to not be drawn out positively, we want it to be in the middle. So we're gonna take this embed value in this brush palette here and we're gonna set it to zero. So now when it draws it out, it's going to look at the surface I'm drawing it out on and it's going to stick it based on its height or its bounding box and the depth in which it's in, bedded into the head, is gonna be at zero. So you're gonna have right in the middle where that part is drawn out. So if I draw this out there, this is what I'm getting now. So it was drawing out at the surface and it's now being generated directly in the middle of that part. Now this may be a little bit too deep for what you want, so now I'm cutting in you know, a lot into the surface here. So I'm gonna come back over here and I'm gonna adjust this a little bit more. So maybe I want my embed value not to be so deep. So maybe 70, see what 70 does. So that's pretty good, but you can see as I get too far past on a curved surface, it's gonna start cutting out because it's embedding a little bit too far. So I can go back in here and change that down a little bit more, maybe to 65, around 60. And now that's giving me a better result. So now, if I use this and draw it out on the model here, you can see it's gonna come through and give me this Boolean shape. So that is the 
you know, pretty quick process of coming through. You want to model the shape positive, flip it inside out, set up your IMM brush, and now you can use this and simply add this detail cut to your mesh now. So now I can make all sorts of crazy stuff, add away, and you've got your own brush. Now, once you're happy with this brush too, you can save it out. So this can just be done by going to the brush option up here and clicking save as. You can then save that brush and then you can load it back in and use it later. Um, with this, we can go also to the geometry tab here and go to the dynamic area and you can turn that on. You'll get a preview version of it too. Uh, so that is that process. So let me look at these questions quick. A uh, question about how can we know the real size or about the size of the object? So your best option for size inside of ZBrush, ZBrush has two areas that kind of control the size. Uh, the first one is in the geometry area and there is a, I've got too many, too many windows open, size area here. And this is the internal ZBrush size. So this is gonna be a value in here based on ZBrush internal size. ZBrush likes it when the mesh is around the internal size of two. So this XYZ size is gonna be that. And then you also have a export slider all the way down at the bottom. And for getting the value of your mesh, basically it's the XYZ size multiplied by the scale, the export scale down here. And then that will give you the value of your model basically resembling millimeters. Uh, there is a plugin called uh, Scale Master, which will automate that process for you. And so you can use this process here and set your scene scale. You can then change the object's dimensions here. So currently, if I do subtools to slider size on this mesh, you can see I'm getting 2.936 by 2.84 by 1. And so for this one, uh, we say you can take that and you can see it's this number here multiplied by that export scale, and that's what you're getting. So that's how you can get your scale for objects inside of ZBrush. Uh, for so in Deep's asking how to use the kit bash mesh in ZBrush. So if you're talking about just using the IMM brushes, so if you go back, uh, YouTube will have a um, replay of the stream I did on a robot. And basically I used the entire IMM model kit brush to make that entire thing. So you can go back and watch that um, Z Classroom Live. So you just go to YouTube and search Z Classroom Live, and it'll be uh, the, I think, building a robot with IMM parts, and that'll go through the entire process of using that um, to make you know, a mesh out of using the kit bash stuff. So that should get you covered on that. Um, Digital Plankton's asking, what is the max geometry that you should keep in the insert meshes to? So there's no real maximum. You can use whatever you want, but just remember when you save that brush out, it's gonna be massive. So basically think that when you save the brush, it's creating a copy of all those meshes in there and saving it in that brush. So I've had a few brushes that I've created for use with insert meshes that contained uh, scan data and also that scan data had color information on it and those brushes were in the gigs. So one brush would be like a gig and a half. Um, and <laughs> so it, it can get really heavy and then when you load those brushes in the ZBrush, it's sometimes gonna be a little bit slow. So what I recommend doing if you're making insert mesh brushes, if you don't need it to be high res, I suggest setting them up to use that dynamic subdivision with like curves and stuff, and then they're lightweight in the IMM part, and then you can just apply them to the model and activate dynamic, and you're gonna get the high resolution uh, result out of it. Uh, what is the difference between Dynamesh, Dynamic, and Divide? So Dynamesh is going to evenly distribute geometry across the surface of your model. So if I take this part here, so let's first talk about, um, we got a few minutes here, we'll cover this. So here we have a mesh and I've turned it into a poly mesh 3D. And so the first option you have for kind of mesh geometry is just a simple mesh. So what you see is what you get, the topology on your model is the topology it has. Now I can apply subdivisions to this and what this is, how this is done is in the tool palette and you click the divide option here. And this will take the geometry and it's gonna subdivide it up. So it's basically taking it and dividing it and giving you more resolution. Now when it does this, it gives you the ability to go back in time to those other subdivisions. So you can see I can go back to the first one, I can go to second, third, fourth, and fifth. Now on a map fourth, if I sculpt, let's say the clay buildup brush, I'm gonna get a lot more resolution than I was getting at subdivision one. So the subdivide option will allow you to keep stages of your mesh and then add topology. 
It's going to divide the current geometry you have on your model as you go up a subdivision, but then that'll allow you to reach higher polygon counts, which is going to allow you to generate different, better sculpting results or marks quality. And then you can always revert back to the lower subdivision level. So that's one option there. Now the DynaMesh option, let me get undo here, is going to take your mesh and it's going to flood it with even topology. So here's my starting mesh here. And if I click DynaMesh, you see it's going to take that model and it's going to flood it. So it's basically looking at that shape and it's flooding it with topology. And it's going to try to flood it with even topology. But you can see it didn't smooth it out because I didn't divide it. So I still have these rough edges on it. However, if I sculpt now, it's going to give me a consistent result wherever I sculpt on the model. Now, if I just did the subdivision one, uh, this area up here didn't have a lot of topology. So even subdividing it, I wouldn't get a consistent stroke. So DynaMesh will retopologize your entire mesh, flood it with even geometry. So when you sculpt something up here, it will also appear the same quality as down there. Now, the final one you're asking about is Z-Remesher. And Z-Remesher is going to retopologize your model. And it's trying to look at the geometry functions on it. So this is good if you have a surface that already has some sculpting on it or maybe some edges set up. You can then run Z-Remesher and this will process the mesh and give you entirely new topology as well, similar to DynaMesh, except it's going to try to keep it nice and neat and quadded. So here's the result after the Z-Remesher on that. So with that, those are the kind of three things there. And then the fourth one you can play with is Sculptress. Um, so the first z Classroom Live video I did will cover the Sculptress Pro Mode. And this is going to allow you to take a model and as you sculpt, it will dynamically tessellate the model. So if I sculpt normally, this is what I'm getting. So it's just pushing the vertices in and out as I sculpt on the mesh. So whatever is existing is already there. It's just going to move those in space. Now, if I have Sculptress Pro on and sculpt with this, it's now going to add topology while performing that push and pull action. So you can see it's come through and it's divided the mesh and it'll divide it on the fly. So I recommend if you want more information on Sculptures Pro, if you're doing any kind of sculpting stuff, this is by far my favorite way to use uh, ZBrush is just using Sculptures Pro. So I'll take any mesh, activate Sculptures Pro, and as you sculpt, it's only gonna divide for what you need based on your brush size. So that's another fun one there. And if you watch the first ZCraftsman Live on sculpting a bust, I go through all that um, and it should give you a bunch of good information to start in that process inside of ZBrush. Um, Gary's asking, say you want to apply a brush all the way around the ring shank, what is the best way? So to do that, as long as your mesh is in the center, what you probably want to end up doing is going to the transform palette up here and activating symmetry. And in here you have a radial symmetry option. Now you can set which axis uh, you want this to happen. So say this is the ring here and set Y. And you can see all these little pips are going around in a radial fashion. So if I sculpt here, you see it's going to sculpt all over. So as long as that ring band is centered, when you activate this, you'll be able to come through and sculpt. And you're going to sculpt in a radial fashion. And this will allow you to you know, do all sorts of crazy stuff just in this radial format. Um, I also used the radial option in the uh, ZCraftsman Live where I covered how to model a tire. I activated the uh, radial option to use with the Z Modeler brush which helps quite a bit, so you don't have to go over all sorts of different edges. If it's cylindrical and it's in the center, turn on radial. It's going to save you a lot of time. Yes, yeah, Hungry Hungry is saying that Divide gives you more polygons, but Dynamesh tessellates. So thank you for adding that. So he's also asking, how do we insert and append tools that we want without disturbing the tools already in the subtools? Every time I try to get a tool that's not in subtools, it resets everything. So to append, you just need to select the tool you want to append to. So say I have my cylinder shape here. Let me quick save this. And if I just want to add to this file or add to this tool, you just come down here and click append. And then whatever you click should append it as a new subtool. So you see it's just going to append it as a ring. Um, so this should be allowing you to do that. Um, I'm not quite sure what you may having uh, issues with. Um, if you can explain a little bit more, I may have some time here to answer it. Sandeep's asking, how do we can do RAM custom settings? Um, there are all the settings inside of ZBrush. As soon as you launch it, we'll end up using the performance that's best for your machine. The only thing that you really ever need to customize, especially if you're doing streaming and stuff, is you may want to turn down how much performance ZBrush is going to use. ZBrush will try to use as much as possible. Uh, so one thing I do, you'll notice on my machine here, is if I go to my performance tab, my max threads, I turn that down. 
So basically give OBS a little bit of power, a little bit of RAM. Um, so I end up going down a little bit on that. But everything else should automatically be calculated to get the best performance out of ZBrush. Um, so if you have something else that's happening with the RAM setting, you're saying an error occurs, I'd highly recommend going to the help option here and clicking on this Pixelogic support and sending in a ticket. And we see if we can look, on, look into that. Um, alphas from images, and if they're a, so Sandeep's asking again, what's the best way to create alphas from images? So next, I think Friday, I'm gonna cover over how to use Spotlight to model some stuff. Uh, so basically we'll use black and white images or alphas is gonna be your best way to get uh, details on models. And you basically wanna think about height maps. So height maps are gonna be your friend. That's what all these are over here. So textures aren't really gonna give you what you want um, in terms of details. You're gonna want height maps or depth maps, like things here, things with gradients. So if you have one of these, you can convert these um, a few ways. One way you can go to the alpha palette, select an alpha, and then you have a create option here, which will create um, a make 3D option here, which will make it out of 3D. Also spotlight, which I'll cover Friday. I believe that's my Friday day of spotlight. Um, I'll go through and add that stuff there. Looking at some more questions here. The tools that you want are not in the append list. So Hungry, what you need, you need to load the tool in first. So if you want to append in another tool, say like, I want to add, say this, um, let's go to the tool option here. I want to add, say, the demo head to this tool. So you want to make sure this is loaded in first. So if I double click the demo head, it'll pop up over here. Once it's over in the tool palette, so you can use this load tool option up here to also load the tools in. Once it's over here, it's over here. If you come in and select the subtool and click append, it should show up in this menu. If it's not showing up in this menu, you wanna make sure it's probably not loaded. So this anything that's loaded inside of ZBrush in that scene you're in is gonna show up in this area and then you should be able to select that and have it show up. Now the demo head has two parts, right? So it's only gonna allow me to select one. So I can select the demo head and then select his head and then I can append that in. But if I wanna append the eyes, I need to go and select that eyes in the subtool and now I need to go back to this tool click append, and now select the eyes. And that's how I can get the eyes in. So you're only gonna be able to append the main, the subtool you have selected currently in the tool. So that could be the issue you're running into um, where you're trying to append something that's in a tool, but it's another subtool. So select that subtool first, then go to the tool you wanna to append and then click it. There's also some options in the Z plugin area up here in the um, Subtool master area here where you can copy and paste uh, different parts of models to other tools. So some of these may be helpful as well in automating that process, especially if you have a tool with a lot of different parts and you wanna append them to another tool. It would take some time to select one and append, select one, append, select one, append. So there's some automation processes in Subtool master that will speed that up. Uh, Lord of the Mountains is asking, I have a sword that I want to position in the character's hands, but I want to bring it back to edit in the world origin. So there's no real way um, to do that uh, inside of ZBrush. The, there is one way you can kind of do it. Well, two ways, but they're really kind of technical setup. One way is you can use a nano mesh, and then you can uh, position the nano mesh on a single plane and position the sword in one hand. And then when you go to edit mode, you can edit it in the center of the world. The other way is you can use a ray mesh so you can create a... Um, arrayed piece of geometry so you have your sword in your center and you can offset the array um, and position it where you want. I may have a Ask ZBrush video on using that. Um, let's see here. Let's see what we get here, internet. But see, maybe, I don't know. I think I did one where I was positioning hands um, for a character. So one, one hand on one side and one hand on the other, and I use the array for it. So that may have it in there. Just do a search for array mesh and positioning Lord of the Mountains, and I may have one in there. But they're kind of high, kind of level stuff, so it's not the simplest process to do. The nano mesh one, I don't, I'm pretty sure I don't have one on that, but um, you can definitely kind of do that. I think I've also done um, some presentations where I've shown it. One of the ZBrush summits, I think. It might have been one that was like labeled tips and tricks or something. Um, had uh, some processes where I had earthquake and I was 
moving some barrels around. I had one in the center and I wanted one over here or his uh, armor plating uh, was what it was for his shoulder. So I had the armor plating in the center so I could use symmetry and then I used the array mesh to offset it and put it on his shoulder so I could see it update as I was modifying the other one. Uh, Dorish, I'm not sure that shouldn't be happening. Um, if it's still happening, you have a repeatable option. Uh, can you send a ticket to the support site? So just pixel logic support, click on that and uh, send that uh, file if it's uh, repeatable. It shouldn't be kicking anything out of the folders. Uh, web watching, web etching. Yes, you can use Sculptures Pro with Live Billions. So Sandeep, I went over the uh, process. You have to go back in time in the stream when it goes on uh, YouTube. Uh, but basically you can use uh, Z Remesher and it will end up uh, adding the edges between those uh, uh, polygroups that it creates. And then you can use creasing based on polygroups and you can get that harsh edge back. Yeah, just do in the, so after you run Z Remesher, go to geometry, go to crease. And if you have a uh, polygroup set up, you can do this uh, crease by polygroup right here. And it should look at those polygroups and give you a crease along those edges. And then when you activate the dynamic, uh, those creases should stay there. Uh, digital plankton, I'm not quite sure on the light cap stuff. Um, Paul's the one to go through for lighting. He just did a whole session yesterday on lighting information. I usually ask him. <laughs> So sorry, I don't, I'm not going to be much help in that uh, that area. All right, well I think that's it for time today. So thank you all for coming out and watching the stream. So I'll be back on Friday at uh, the same time. So we'll be doing some stuff, and I believe Friday I'm going over the um, using the spotlight processes to start generating models with that, and then they'll also go into tangents with the live boolean system to model uh, assets. So I think I'm doing a weapon part on Friday. So more shape building and more defining stuff, but it kind of plays into, you know, some of the stuff we had questions at the end here of using alphas to create geometry. Um, so definitely if you're interested in that, uh, please show back up on Friday. So I hope you all are well, stay safe. And once again, if you have anyone that's looking to learn ZBrush, the trial is now available. You can download this from the Pixelogic site. Just do a search for Pixelogic trial. It'll take you here. You'll get the full version of 2020 to mess with for 30 days. There's also an option for the bridge as well at the bottom here, so you can get a trial of that too, and you can end up starting sculpting. Uh, we're doing these developer streams uh, probably till the end of this pandemic, and so we're trying to do a developer stream every day. And with these, um, they're covering different things. So uh, Solomon and Daisuke are gonna be doing some more ZBrush core stuff. I'm doing more of this kind of ZBrush Z Classroom live stuff. Paul's doing a lot of tips and tricks and the high level type stuff. So definitely if you have anyone that's looking to ZBrush, um, trying to learn the software, definitely come on out. And once again, it's always live. So if you have any questions, I try to answer what I can. Um, if you have anything I didn't answer, you have any problems or issues that you think may be a bug, uh, definitely the biggest thing to do to help us on our side is just submit a ticket to support and go to Click this Pixelogic support link inside of ZBrush. This will open up a web page for you. Fill that out. If it's repeatable, that's the biggest thing. So if you run across anything, um, we had something here with uh, appending to a folder, kicking out something. like So something like that, if it's repeatable, if you can send us the file, it helps quite a bit. Then we can look at it and try to lock down, you know, well, what's causing this, and then get it fixed in the patch. So definitely um, do that if you're having any issues. So thank you all, and I think that is it. Thanks again. Happy ZBrushing.